three. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm just waiting here for to get up on YouTube. Okay. Slow down for a second. No worries. All right, we're ready to go. Three. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm just waiting here for to get. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Kenya McDuffie. I am council member for Ward Five and chair of the Council's Committee on Business and Economic Development. Today is Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022, and we are convening this public hearing virtually via Zoom. Uh, the time is 9.03 a.m., and I'm calling to order this performance oversight hearing of the committee. Today marks the committee's fourth performance oversight hearing, and we will hear from the Public Service Commission, the Office of People's Council, the Mayor's Office of Nightlife and Culture, and the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration. Uh, to establish the order for the day, public witnesses are going to all have three minutes each to provide oral testimony, and council members will have uh, three minutes for opening statements. I will call all public witnesses to testify first before calling the government witnesses uh, following the conclusion of the public witnesses. I would also like to remind everyone that all participants should please mute their microphones when they are not speaking. We're gonna, we're gonna begin with the, uh, the public witnesses uh, for the Public Service Commission, uh, also referred to as PSC. The mission of the PSC of the District of Columbia is to serve the public interest by ensuring that financially healthy electric, natural gas, and telecommunications companies provide safe, reliable, and quality utility services at reasonable rates for district residential, business, and government customers. The commission has identified three goals for carrying out its mission. First, uh, economic development, as well as public safety and uh, customer satisfaction. The commission contributes to the economic development of the district through the continued regulation of monopoly electric and natural gas distribution services. Public safety promoted through the natural gas pipeline safety and public payphone programs and the investigation of certain occurrences such as manhole explosions and utility outages. Customer satisfaction is encouraged by increasing public access to the commission. Uh, I'm going to turn, before we turn to our public witnesses for the testimony, I'm going to recognize uh, my colleague, Ward 2 Council Member and member of the committee, Brooke Pinto, to see if you'd like to provide an open statement. And good morning to you, Council Member Pinto. Thanks so much. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie. And thank you again for holding this performance oversight hearing today. I just wanted to thank all of our public witnesses for testifying today and I hope you all know that your testimony is really a critical piece of this oversight process and how we can ensure that we move forward towards our goals as a city. Um, so looking forward to hearing your testimony today and looking forward to hearing from Chairman Thompson at the Public Service Commission. Well, the Public Service Commission is a technical regulatory body for which subject matter expertise, expertise and regulatory experience is very important as we talked about last year during the confirmation process I'm eager to hear today how the chairman has developed and will continue to develop and advance a long-term vision to achieve the district's climate change reversal goals, implementing grid modernization and supporting our low-income ratepayers. I'm eager today to speak to public witnesses and Chairman Thompson on how we can best achieve these goals going forward and importantly hear about the progress we've made over the course of the last year. I look forward to hearing from People's Council about the important work the office does to ensure district residents have access to safe, affordable, and reliable utility and energy services. Looking forward to hearing from Director Musali, the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration, and Director Vandernot from the Office of Nightlife and Culture about balancing all of our needs or recovering local businesses with the needs and concerns of area residents. Our nightlife is a huge part of our culture here in DC and an integral part of our COVID recovery efforts. So thank you again, Chairman McDuffie. Thank you, Council Member Pinto. We're gonna turn uh, now to uh, a panel of public witnesses, uh, beginning with Laura Levinson. And good morning to you. Thank you for being here this morning. You can begin your testimony. You have three minutes to provide it. If we can get the staff to uh, adjust the, the timer. I think it's still running on Council Member Pinto's opening when I should start. <laughs> uh, you can begin now. 
Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you. Council Member, Member McDuffie and Pinto. My name is Laura Levison. I am the Energy, Energy Committee Chair for the DC Sierra Club, and I'm testifying as an individual Ward 6 resident today on the topic of methane gas and ending the combustion of gas inside buildings in the district. Like many of the other witnesses you'll hear from today, not long ago, I walked around my neighborhood checking for gas leaks with the handheld gas detector. I knew we would find gas leaks, but finding them for myself was a powerful experience. Methane gas was leaking from almost every manhole or meter cover that we checked. Most of the amounts we found that day were small, but small leaks add up. Other witnesses at this hearing will talk about the citizen science report on gas leaks that was released today. The report shows that gas is leaking all over the city and sometimes in large amounts. Ending the use of methane gas in DC will protect the climate, improve local air quality, and eliminate a major source of indoor air pollution. It will also enable us to put the billions of dollars that Altagas is planning to spend on gas pipe replacements to much better use. It will be essential to provide funding for low and moderate income households to make the transition from gas to high efficiency electric heat pumps for space and water heating and induction ranges for cooking. I was shocked to learn just a couple years ago that the gas appliances inside our homes are causing indoor air pollution at levels that would exceed EPA standards if they were outdoors. For decades, the gas industry has promoted gas stoves and other appliances without any mention of the indoor air pollution from carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, formaldehyde, nor any mention of the harm to our health from those pollutants. Now researchers are finding that even when gas appliances are not combusting gas in our homes, methane is still leaking out of them. <clears throat> it is simply not credible that the gas industry doesn't know that gas appliances are emitting these pollutants into our homes and into our lungs. They just don't want us to know. I have no doubt that in time we will find out that the gas industry hid the harmful effects of their products from the public, the indoor effects, just like the tobacco industry with lung cancer, the lead industry with permanent neurological damage, the oil industry with climate change, and other industries that have covered up the terrible consequences of their products. Enough is enough. I urge the council to pass legislation requiring the Public Service Commission to develop and execute a plan to end the combustion of methane gas in buildings in the District of Columbia, and importantly, to help WGL and its workers transition to a new business model. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. And thank you for your testimony. We're gonna go next to Mark Krasowski, or I think I mispronounced that. Krasowski. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, and the other members and staff of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mark Kreswick. I'm a district resident and father of two young children. Before the pandemic started, I walked my preschooler less than a block to Barnard Elementary. Every day we caught a whiff of a gas leak on 4th Street that took months to fix. Turns out my neighborhood has one of the highest rates of gas leaks in the district, according to DOEE. My friends just removed the gas line to their house by installing heat pumps and an induction stove after they and their newborn were evacuated around midnight because gas from their neighbor's house had leaked inside theirs. To paraphrase their conversation the next day, gas leaks and then explodes. What a dumb way to get energy inside our homes. We're going all electric. Burning gas inside our buildings may be dumb for health and safety, but it's even worse from a business and economic development perspective. We don't produce gas here in the district, so every dollar we spend on fossil fuels leaves our economy. Every bit of gas that moves under our sidewalks and into our homes, leaking and burning, unnecessarily pollutes our lungs, disrupts our climate, and wastes our money. Alta Gas has already charged DC ratepayers hundreds of millions of dollars for replacing pipes, but the rate of leaks has actually increased during that time. Next, they plan to take more than $4 billion over the next four de decades from DC families and businesses. Instead of continuing with a failed project pipes, it's past time for the PSC to plan an equitable transition off gas. DOE hasn't just mapped gas leaks. They've also mapped out what needs to happen. By 2026, every new building needs to be net zero. And by 2035, every appliance sold needs to be electric. On track for 70% of our homes to be all electric by 2040 and all of them carbon neutral by 2050. The best way to do that is through comprehensive beneficial electrification of entire neighborhoods, starting with those most plagued by leaking pipes and those who have been historically overburdened and underserved in our community. That's the orderly cost-effective path toward a more affordable, prosperous, healthy, safe, and comfortable clean energy economy. And it's one that the PSC must oversee. 
There are more than 120,000 low-income households in DC, those living on less than 80% of our area median income, threatened with future utility disconnections and evictions. They can't be the last ones stuck paying for Alta Gas's rapidly escalating gas prices. We need to mobilize funding for comprehensive retrofits of those homes and small businesses off gas, just like my friends did for their home. And that starts by ending project pipes in the leaking, dangerous, unhealthy gas system. Instead of charging DC families and businesses billions more to continue making the problem worse, leverage federal funding from ARPA, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, the Green Bank, the SEU, PEPCO, and other sources for retrofitting entire neighborhoods off gas, ending any leaks, and avoiding the cost of repair and replacing pipes. Imagine the quality family supporting jobs that could be created right here in the district through such investment, renovations and appliance installations, electrical system upgrades, and more. Chairman McDuffie, you introduced the Underground Utility Work Minimum Wage and Prevailing Wage Act of 2021, so you know that many of those jobs could pay well with that legislation. Together, we can tackle the challenge of ensuring that the transition off fossil fuels in our existing buildings is equitable, centering the needs of those who are most energy and housing burden in our communities. Thank you for your leadership and oversight of the PSC. It's time to tell them to get moving to save ratepayers money, grow our economy, and protect our homes, businesses, lungs, and climate. And thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next on the list is Jean Stewart. Good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, Chairman McDuffie and Council Member uh, Pinto. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Jean Stewart, and I'm a 50 plus year resident of Ward 1. I'm a volunteer with the DC Sierra Club and a member of the Washington Interfaith Network, WIN, through the <clears throat> Church of the Pilgrims. Recently, I participated in the gas leak detection project, and it was eye-opening to see so many leaks from the streets that we covered in Ward 1, some near churches and schools. The most alarming were right next to the Harris Teeter grocery store on Calorama Road. These leaks right in my neighborhood were very frightening to me. Methane gas leaking in so many places is an alarming signal of how we are poisoning our environment in D.C. Inside our buildings, methane gas leaks from stoves and other appliances, including when they're turned off, and the burning of methane for heating and cooking pollute the air we breathe indoors with carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, and formaldehyde. These lead to health problems like asthma, other respiratory diseases, and cardiovascular disease, exacerbating health problems especially common in our poorer communities. Washington Gas is promoting a huge project to replace all their pipes in D.C. at the cost of $5 billion. This cost will be passed on to ratepayers with escalating rates as this very expensive replacement goes on. As the electric grid grows more efficient and the cost of renewables continues to move downward, methane gas will be used less and less, leaving $5 billion worth of pipes as a stranded asset. I urge opposition to this expensive, inefficient, and unhealthy gas pipe replacement plan, and instead, I urge investment in electrification and increased use of renewable energy. We need legislation to move from leaky pipes and, and spending huge amounts of my and my neighbor's money on a climate killing, inequitable and dirty fuel source and in, uh, instead to invest in building the clean, green and healthy energy system we need going forward. The district has committed to a 50% reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions by 2032 and net zero emissions by 2050. To meet these commitments, DC must stop burning all fossil fuels, including gas. I strongly support these commitments because I want to reduce the damaging effects of climate change and because I care about the health and safety of my neighbors, especially my lower income neighbors that bear the the brunt of pollution, heat waves, flooding, and other effects of the ever morning, uh, warming planet. And I ask that the council um, would ensure that the PSC remain accountable to my neighbors and not Washington Gas. I also request that the council consider legislation for a speedy and equitable transition from methane gas to clean sourced electricity. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Mark Rodifer. 
Uh, good morning to you, and you can begin your testimony. All right. Well, good morning to you, Councilmember McDuffie, and also Councilmember Pinto. Uh, my name is Mark Rodifer, and I'm representing the Sierra Club. The Public Service Commission must take proactive leadership to ensure it meets its statutory requirement to achieve DC's climate commitment of eliminating fossil fuel combustion by 2050. For the most part, the commission merely reacts to proposals from the utilities. The commission needs to end delays with projects identified by the pilot project governance by the pilot projects governance board. The board identified proposals for a number of innovative projects, such as a district heat pump system, a renewable energy microgrid, a virtual power plant using locally distributed energy sources, and, and, uh, and others. But the commission has not issued a single RFP for any one of these projects. The Sierra Club urges the commission to take action. Alta Gas, the Canadian fracked gas company that owns Washington Gas, is seeking to charge DC ratepayers for fossil fuel infrastructure until 2085. That's 35 years after DC has committed to ending fossil fuel use. This is akin to taking out a 63-year mortgage on a home that will not be habitable in 28 years. To correct the poor financial planning proposed by Alta Gas, the commission should require that all gas assets be fully depreciated by 2050. This means that all debt for the utility's fossil fuel assets must be fully paid off by 2050. The commission has opened a proceeding on climate matters, but unfortunately the commission has structured it to merely react to utility proposals rather than directing the utilities to eliminate fossil fuel combustion. Alta Gas has made clear it will not make a good faith effort to eliminate fossil fuel combustion, so the commission must move the utility in that direction. As you've heard from others uh, today, the Beyond Gas DC Coalition today released a survey finding hundreds of methane gas leaks across DC, some of them approaching the explosive level. Alta Gas wants to charge DC residents almost $5 billion to maintain its fossil fuel distribution system. Instead of this wasteful spending, the DC Council should pass legislation directing the commission to open a regulatory proceeding to determine how DC's gas utility will end its reliance on fossil fuels and shift to non-combustible clean energy. A 2020 report produced for the Office of People's Council cited PEPCO's slow interconnection process as one of the key barriers to achieving uh, DC's re renewable energy requirements under the re renewable portfolio standard. The commission must fix this. PEPCO has also failed to PEPCO has failed to distribute accrued credits for solar energy uh, to to participate to uh, people who are participating in the Solar for All program. This undermines the program's affordability, wastes resources, and it jeopardizes residents' faith in solar power. Exelon, Pepco's parent company, is a multi-billion dollar corporation whose CEO is paid $15 million a year. For Exelon to withhold money owed to low-income residents for solar credits is unconscionable. The Public Service Commission has failed to stop this injustice. Uh, the Sierra Club does applaud the, the commission, on the other hand, for requiring that Pepco procure 5% of its electricity from long-term power purchase agreements for newly constructed uh, renewable energy facilities. But month after month, Pepco states in filings before the commission that it is still in contract negotiations on the PPA. The Sierra Club calls on the commission to exercise its oversight, oversight authority and move this project forward. Uh, thank you again, Councilman McDuffie, for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, DC is making progress on our climate commitments, but uh, with business as usual, we will not achieve achieve carbon neutrality, and that we need proactive leadership from the Public Service Commission to make sure that our climate commitments are met. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Kia Chatterjee. And good morning to you. Thank you for being here. Okay, we can see you. And Good morning. Thank you, Chair McDuffie and Councilmember Pinto. Uh, my apologies for being in transit. Uh, my name is Kaya Chatterjee. I am an ANC commissioner in 6A01, which is on H Street Northeast between H Street and Florida Avenue Northeast. I wanted to share some of the experience of, of my constituents with methane gas in particular. I have quite a few constituents who have gotten sick and who are renters and have not been able to get their landlords to switch out uh, the, the gas appliances for electric appliances um, and have had long-term health effects as a result. Some of them are dealing with long COVID and it's been exacerbating uh, to, to the point where people are missing work and unable to, to go about their jobs. I've had many, many other residents have, uh, have near explosive issues with methane gas in their homes. Um, I, you know, and I think that the question I constantly get asked is, what can be done about this and why is nothing being done? And I have to explain, well, this is a monopoly. Uh, we have some oversight through the Public Service Commission and I'm constantly being asked, what is the Public Service Commission doing about this? I had a, uh, a constituent who's eight months pregnant a few weeks ago, whose uh, 
whose gas lines flooded and they therefore did not have heat, hot water or the ability to cook. And it was less than 20 degrees outside a couple of weeks ago. That, I mean, I literally have dozens of constituents constantly asking me what the plan is. How do we meet our climate change goals and, and find, find a way to keep ourselves safe? The current situation is not safe. I'm going to highlight in particular on L Street Northeast and 13th Street Northeast. There are basically constantly Washington gas vehicles there, and and there are constant leaks, um, which means that residents are constantly being disrupted, and it and and they need support. And I would just I just want to highlight in particular how difficult this has been for renters, for owners. At least there is that option of being able to switch out your appliances. But right now there is no requirement that landlords do this, um, and it's a it's obviously a major health and safety issue because methane gas is explosive. Uh, but it's also a major health and safety issue because of of the headaches and nausea that my constituents are continually reporting to me um, from not being able to get off of methane gas. So I, like others have called for, I would call for uh, a, re- a legislation that requires the PSC to transition off of gas um, that provides workforce training so that we can move towards um, switching out appliances, heat pumps, induction stoves electric water, this technology has been around for a long time right now, and we should use $5 billion if we're, if we're going to be eventually be paying it as residents, we should use it to, to, to get safe appliances for our constituents. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your testimony. We're going to turn next to Max Broad, and good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Councilmember McDuffie and Councilmember Pinto, good to be with you here uh, before the Business and Economic Development Committee testifying about the DC Public Service Commission. And uh, again, my name is Max Broad. I'm the group leader of the Washington DC chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. CCL, we're a nonprofit organization that empowers people to use their personal and political resources to find climate solutions. Our DC members belong to one of hundreds of chapters around the world seeking to create the political will for a livable world. Um, You know, we typically work with Congress to persuade Congress to pass carbon fee and dividend legislation uh, as a solution that that economists and climate scientists say is a best first step to preventing the worst impacts of a warming world. This is a policy that would drastically reduce emissions, and we still have hopes that Congress will act on this legislation. Uh, yet today we're urging local action. The Public Service Commission, we're asking to um, meet DC statutory requirements to end fossil fuel combustion and reach net zero emissions by 2050. This goal takes on added urgency with the Beyond Gas DC Coalition's recent discovery of more than 338 locations with methane leaks across all eight wards of the city. The alarming revelation has serious implications for the health of DC families as well as for the health of the planet. New research links links rising asthma rates in children to living in homes with gas stoves. Uh, This disproportionately affects low-income households in DC. And many wealthy families are able to use private funds to install heat pumps or solar panels or other means of reducing emissions in households. Further, methane is more than 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in its first 20 years in the atmosphere. So it, it's critical that we act on the local level as well as the national. And you know, the commission, the PSC must exert leadership to implement technologies and, and policies that modernize delivery of energy output. Uh, we join in the request that they uh, issue the request for proposals um, and move forward with the innovative, innovative pilot projects such as district heat pump and renewable energy grid. So um, I, we hope that the PSC will move forward on that expeditiously. Also, um, we understand that Washington Gas plans to spend billions of dollars to replace gas pipes in DC. This investment in fossil fuel infrastructure would lock us into polluting technologies for decades. We need to invest in a new cleaner system that relies on local generation of renewable energy. In conclusion, the DC chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby entreats the council to pass legislation that would require the commission to determine how DC's gas utility will abide by the statutory requirement to end fossil fuel combustion and achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2050. We ask you what the DC council will take to implement the goals that 
put DC in the forefront of commitments on climate change? How will you ensure that we have a chance to reach our goals and demonstrate that the nation's capital can set an example in the struggle to address climate change? Thank you again for hearing the testimony from us and other like-minded organizations representing the climate currents of deep concerns of DC residents. And thank you for your testimony. We're gonna turn next to Holly Pollinger. Hello, good morning. My name is Holly Pollinger and I'm the founder of Glover Park Village Green. As a resident for 50 years, I'm proud of Washington DC's record as one of the leading cities in the country to fight climate change. But we do have a problem. As you already know, in November 2021, more than 100 countries signed the Global Methane Pledge to decrease methane emissions by at least 30% between 2020 and 2030. And past reports indicate that oil and gas industry plumes have collectively released about 8 million tons of methane per year making up roughly 10% of the industry's estimated global emissions. But on February 14th, happy Valentine's Day, satellites revealed huge methane emissions from oil and gas sites, most never before seen, up close and personal worldwide. What does this mean? It means we are in even worse trouble than we thought. Washington DC was not singled out as a major emitter, but the US is in the top three of the worst emitters. Hidden methane emissions are the hot topic of today. And it turns out that unit unlit gas stoves are not the only culprits. Our own city, Washington DC, has hundreds of methane leaks. Aren't we lucky to have citizens willing to give up their time and energy to finding some of these leaks? The solution is not to allow Washington Gas to spend $5 billion to replace every single pipe in the district. Face it, Washington Gas is either gonna go out of business or it's going to have to be con con converted to become a clean energy provider. Instead of buying into a failing system that is inefficient and tremendously damaging to the climate and the health of our families, we can invest in the electrification and increase local generation of renewable energy. And now it's up to you our elected officials to do something about it. We will watch and we will help you do the right thing. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, next on our witness list is Richard Vilmany. If you wanna unmute yourself and there we go. And good morning to you, you can begin your testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, Council Member McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, the, the Public Service Commission and all those attending with the, here with us this morning. My name is Richard Vilmane. I'm a resident of Ward 2, a parishioner of St. Margaret's Episcopal Church and a member of the Washington Interfaith Network. I first became involved with the gas leak detection project in 2021. The goal of the project was to look for gas leaks in neighborhoods in all eight wards. During my first trip out in Van Ness, I was shocked at how many leaks we encountered. I assumed there would be only minimal leakage in, a, in that wealthy neighborhood. Instead, we found significant leaks in most utility access points that we checked. In total, Wynn found nearly 400 leaks spanning all eight wards. In DC, the largest source of greenhouse gas pollution is from buildings with nearly a quarter coming from gas. It is affecting everyone's health, not to mention the environment, yet it is invisible to most. This gas is speeding the climate catastrophe and making summers hotter 
and deadlier for the lowest income residents, including those facing housing insecure, insecurity. Recently, we have seen a lot of publicity about the harmful effects of methane emissions, which leak from gas stoves even when they are not in use. Meanwhile, gas that is burned as is intended to be, especially from gas stoves, pollutes indoor air with nitrogen dioxide, soot, and other toxins. Children raised in homes with a gas stove are 42% more likely to have asthma. In DC, we know that children living in Ward 8 are 10 times more likely to visit the hospital due to asthma. As a parent myself, this is something that troubles me greatly. For me, environmental equality means that we must transition to a green economy and green infrastructure. Washington Gas wants to spend $5 billion, that's billion with the capital B, to replace their gas pipes. Instead of continuing to invest in a toxic infrastructure that is inefficient and damaging the planet and our families, we should immediately invest in electric and renewable energy. DC has committed to a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2032 and net zero by 2050. To reach those goals, we must cease burning fossil fuels, including gas. I'm calling on the council to introduce legislation to invest our taxpayer dollars into new, clean, and healthy renewable energy to meet those goals, and to direct a public service commission to focus on the transition from gas, not pipe replacement. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. We're going to move next to Patricia Briggs. And good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Um, good morning, um, Council um, Chairman um, McDuffie and Council members. My name is Patricia Briggs. I'm a member of the Washington Interface Network and um, St. Augustine Catholic Church, which is located in War II. I am testifying today because I want to provide a voice for the people who are often somehow being left out of the conversation when it comes to protecting the environment so everyone can engage in healthy living. There seems to be talk starting about commercial buildings being sustainable and reducing their, their carbon dioxide footprint by 2032. That's good but I'm not hearing a lot of talk or action when it comes to the people who are living in low income housing. Most of these individuals, including children, are having to deal with inhaling gas pollutants when gas is burned, like in our, in our stoves, which can lead them to develop chronic conditions like COPD and asthma. These issues is important and must change to give our families, especially our kids, a chance to be healthy. In the last year, I have had the pleasure of participating in gas leak detection with people from the DC churches who care about affordable housing that is also healthy and green. One of the areas where we performed gas leak detections was in the Capitol Hill and Eastern Market area. While walking on the Capitol Hill side, one thing that became very noticeable to me is the amount of gas manholes that were plugged, meaning closed. And there were not very many. But while walking towards Eastern Market, there were many gas manholes, including in areas like in front of churches, schools, a couple of mom and pop stores, crossing intersections, and apartment buildings. The two that were used to test for gas in these areas detected high levels of gas being released. I have participated in leak detection in over a dozen neighborhoods, and we have found leaks in all of them. I would like to leave you with this. I personally have seen the harmful gas that's been released into the environment in neighborhoods all over D.C. Nothing matters if there is no environment. Once there are no gas pipes, there won't be leaks either. So I look forward to the day when we don't have to burn gas in our homes which will also help us live healthier lives. What can you do to make this happen faster? Thank you. And thank you for your testimony here this morning. Um, we're gonna to turn to, I believe our last public witness for this panel, uh, John Moore. And good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Council Member uh, McDuffie and Council Member Pinto. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. 
Uh, I'm a resident of Ward 4, lived here for over 40 years. Uh, I've been involved with the Washington Interfaith Network and also with the DC chapter of the Sierra Club, uh, really pushing for affordable, healthy housing, green housing, and in particular, moving away from methane gas heating and, and, um, and heating. Um, I think I, I support fully the uh, uh, testimony of uh, fellow members of WIN and the Sierra Club on details of how to go forward. Um, I, don't, I won't go through that, but I wanted to focus on one major thing. Living in Ward 4, I um, am in a privileged part of the city compared to folks who live in 7 and 8, and that is more things get done here than get done there. And in particular, um, I had a, a real gas leak problem in my house and on our street, and both of them got fixed pretty quickly. Um, they got fixed, but what I didn't know was that the gas in my house was not healthy. Uh, I had a son who had pretty severe asthma. I don't know that it was because of the gas cooking and the heating in the basement, but it could well have been. Uh, the other thing I also found out was that um, the uh, efficiencies of doing the heating is really bad. But the main thing that what I see is uh, more homes like mine uh, are going to be switching off of gas. Um, my furnace is 60, 70 years old. It's, I've been told by many it's dangerous. I need to replace it. I am going to proceed in looking into replacement. I'm being examining switching to heat pumps because of their efficiency and how well they work. But as I switch off, that means I'm not going to be a ratepayer anymore. Who's going to be left with the rate paying? The people that can't afford easily to switch from methane gas. And that's why I think it's extremely important that the uh, council get uh, instituted programs through the PSC that really help with people switching. And this is, uh, I think, a really crucial, really uh, important uh, environmental justice issue that is protect those families that don't have the means to protect themselves. So I won't say more, but I just wanted to say I applaud uh, this uh, uh, council's looking at it. I hope you will pass legislation I hope you will get the PSC to do what it really should be doing, and that is protecting the citizens, not just the uh, Washington gas. Thank you again. And thank you uh, for your testimony, and thank you to all the witnesses who testified this morning. Actually, you know, uh, and just for staff, we, we can do a seven-minute uh, seven round. Um, uh, I want to pick up where, where uh, Mr. Moore just left off. Uh, you know, uh, this panel raised questions about uh, gas and, and, and gas leaks. And one of the things you, you mentioned in your testimony is um, the cost of transitioning. Uh, I think it is something that uh, even if uh, residents would like to, uh, can present really serious challenges. And so uh, tossing that question to this panel, anybody who wants to, to answer it, uh, what solutions do you have uh, about the prevalence of gas use in homes throughout the District of Columbia and the challenges with uh, those who might want to switch having the ability, capacity, and the means to do so in a way that is equitable? Anybody can 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 answer it. Uh, I don't know, Ms. Moore, you want to answer it? Anybody else? I see. Uh, go ahead. You can answer, sir. Sure, if nobody else wants to. Um, uh, one of the most important things is making sure that for those who uh, don't have capital to invest in things like heat pumps and induction stoves is that they can make this transition at no cost. And so instead of um, spending $4 billion uh, to repair and replace these costs, we could be putting that money into helping those who are uh, unable to come up with that capital cost uh, to make this transition, right? The DC SEU has already started a pilot program uh, to uh, do these conversions, uh, certainly tapping into the full scope, the Green Bank, the SEU, federal funding from ARPA and Infrastructure Investment Act uh, that's coming to the district, like the weather through the weatherization assistance program, for instance, 
putting all of these uh, different funding sources together into this comprehensive retrofit approach. Uh, no cost for those who uh, are un unable to come up with that capital is critically important, right? Um, so again, instead of spending $4 billion repairing and placing pipes over the next four decades, we can put those $4 billion into um, uh, this, tra this transition for both small businesses and again, those who can't afford to make the transition on their own. And thank you for that. Go ahead, sure, Ms. Ms. Moore. Um, I think one of the important parts of it too is this uh, being a comprehensive approach that covers both the electrical side and the gas side, and that is strengthening the electrical grid system and assisting uh, PEPCO in being ready to do this transition. So that's why it's so important that the council have a strong role in working on this and coming up with the legislation. Um, and there are a lot of obviously details, uh, different places funds can be found, but I, I think it is this comprehensive approach that's gonna help uh, assist with those that do not have the means to, to switch. Thank you. Sure, sure. I don't think anybody else wants to weigh in. Um, how, how do you all find that people in the community are receiving this information? Um, how, how are you sharing it? What groups are you working with to engage a diverse group of uh, uh, people across the District of Columbia, particularly those who are, are gonna be impacted? I mean, I think we're all impacted by this, we can agree. Um, but um, I think some of you all have pointed out that some of our most vulnerable residents, uh, and I think um, Patricia Briggs also uh, mentioned this, um, how are they being, how are you all reaching out to them and, and making sure that they have a seat at the table to, to be involved in these conversations so you can hear uh, directly from them? And anybody can answer the question. I wasn't calling on anyone in particular. Hi, Council Member McDuffie. Sure. The, um, the, the Citizen Gas Leak Project was a, a partnership of the Washington Interfaith Network and Sierra Club. And, and that project included congregations from every ward in the city and residents from every part of the city. So I would say that uh, there's been, there's, and, and part of what happens when you go out with a leak detector is that people come up to you and ask you what you're doing and you interact and you discuss, and they're usually pretty surprised and concerned to learn that there's <laughs> methane gas leaking out of their street and sometimes they say, oh, I always smell gas over there. And uh, so the gas leak teams come from, you know, different different economic echelons of DC and have interacted across the city with a wide variety of people to talk about these issues and really uh, do that education and conversation at the person to person level. And, and, and do you all feel that it's been representative across the District of Columbia? And, and do you all feel that the folks that you're talking to across the district residents, ordinary people who are impacted, because this is a performance oversight hearing, but what are you all hearing about the work of the Public Service Commission? Uh, and I'll throw OPC in too. I know we're not technically on OPC just yet, but it is the uh, advocate for the consumer. So I'll throw it out there too as well. Yeah, well, I think this is what the PSC and the OPC need to do with the other agencies in the district is hold that kind of stakeholder process, right, to get that feedback to help plan the transition. Um, that's what the PSC needs to be directed to do. They haven't done it yet, um, right? This, this information is there before the PSC and they're not acting. So I really think it is you... Uh, who need to give the direction to the PSC and OPC to start that stakeholder process to ensure that feedback is fully incorporated as they plan a transition off gas. Uh, thank you for that. Anybody else get away in with my last few seconds? Council sure. member, if you could ask also the next panel, this uh, Barbara Briggs was, was one of the leaders in this effort. She's unfortunately not on this panel, but she was with almost every leaks team and she could give you a very uh, broad picture, um, you know, a more detailed picture of the interactions that we experienced on this project. Sure, I appreciate you mentioning that. And uh, hopefully uh, Barbara Riggs can hear me, but I'll, I'll, I'll certainly have staff, if I don't recall to nudge me to make sure that I, I throw that question out to, to uh, the next panel as well. Uh, thank you uh, all for your testimony. I'm gonna turn now to my colleague, uh, Brooke Pinto for a round. 
Great. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, a lot of really interesting ideas here. I want to start with Mr. Kresowick. Um, I'm interested about your thoughts for no cost investment conversions away from gas. And you mentioned use of some of the ARPA funding and using uh, the $4 billion for repairs for retrofitting. Do you know if all of this funding is, uh, if the guidelines include using this funding for retrofitting purposes? Yes. Um, it, when I say retrofit, I'm talking about a comprehensive retrofit, right? So health and safety repairs, energy efficiency, electrification, kind of all the things that are needed to um, move a home uh, fully off gas. Um, some of those things are definitely eligible under ARPA funding. Um, others are eligible under, uh, for instance, again, the weatherization assistance program uh, increase. Uh, that was included in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Uh, there's HUD money um, that can be used for some of these purposes. Um, so uh, portions of that kind of comprehensive approach is how do you stack and braid these funds together um, to enable those comprehensive retrofits that's uh, most critical. And that's where, again, this interagency collaboration and stakeholder process is so critical to develop that kind of one-stop shop, whole home retrofit approach. Mm -hmm. And I'll just find that the last of the PSC is needed to direct it this on a neighborhood basis, right? To say, okay, if we do run that throughout the entire neighborhood, we can shut down this entire section of the gas system and save that money that won't have to be spent to repair and replace it. That's where the PSC really needs to step in to kind of direct this entire process to make sure it's most cost effective and equitable. Okay, thank you so much. That's certainly something we can speak with Mr. Thompson about later this morning or this afternoon. Um, Ms. Levison, you spoke about the need for legislation to require the PSC to end use of combustion gas in buildings. Do you have anything else to add to um, off-ramps that you think are needed for that mission or other jurisdictions who have outright banned it as well? Uh, thanks for the question, Council Member Pinto. We're, we're asking for the Council to pass um, a directive for the Public Service Commission to, to plan a transition, but not trying to um, necessarily seek an immediate gas ban, but rather we need, as others have described, um, a very planned and well thought out transition that also transitions the, the WGL utility to another method of providing, you know, to different energy services, providing clean energy services, because we, we value the, you know, we, we know the great value of that workforce and, and uh, that uh, the services that they could be able to provide. Sorry, I'm not a little distracted because I've got DC water in my front yard today <laughs> digging up the sewer line. <laughs> so uh, we do have a lot of specific ideas. We'd put more than half. We'd love to come and talk to you about them in detail. Um, uh, there are a lot of good models being laid out in other states, absolutely. And uh, we'd love to put those together and lay those before the council. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rodifer, you mentioned in your written testimony that the commission should look to Vermont as an example for some of its efforts to offer electric heat pumps. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what Vermont is doing in this space? Yes, so um, Vermont Gas, I think, is the name of their utility. Uh, and Vermont, by the way, is a little smaller than D.C. in population. Um, but it's, it's, you know, actually on the statehood issue, we always point out that Vermont is one of two states that has a smaller population than DC. I think they have 50,000 fewer people. Anyway, my point is it's, the population is about the same and their winters are a lot colder uh, than ours here in DC. And their gas utility uh, has a program where they are, um, they are installing uh, electric heat pumps to transition people off of gas. Um, and they're doing it, like I said, in a place that is much colder than, um, than our climate here in DC. Unfortunately, uh, Alta Gas, uh, which is a Canadian fracked gas company based in Calgary that owns Washington Gas, they have not shown any sort of attempt to make any good faith effort to do what they said they would do when they bought Washington Gas a few years ago, which was transition to a new business model that didn't rely on the combustion of fossil fuels. They have fanciful plans about gas from cow manure and things like that. Uh, that will not work. The quantities of it are, there's not enough of it. It's way too expensive. Instead, they should be doing things like um, what is happening in Vermont, where uh, you know the gas utility is actually moving towards efficient renewable uh, heating systems instead of polluting ones? Um, 
But like I said, unfortunately, we don't think Alta Gas is probably going to do that. And that's where the commission really uh, uh, has to step up. And the commission needs to take proactive leadership. Uh, you know, and I, I remember Council Member Pinto at uh, Commissioner Thompson's uh, confirmation hearing, you were asking him, are you going to take proactive leadership? And he said, yes, I will do that if I'm confirmed. We shouldn't just react to what the utilities are doing. And I think now is a time where uh, we really need to see uh, Commissioner Thompson, interim chairman Thompson, uh, follow up on that commitment and take proactive leadership and not, uh, you know, wait for what the gas utility, uh, wait for whatever they say they're gonna do and then split the baby. It's time for them to say, okay, you guys need to get serious about the transition off of gas. Um, and so so I hope you can you can talk with, um, with uh, Commissioner Thompson about that later today. Great, well, thank you so much. And, you know, I'm, trying to figure out how I can frame this question because I know this could be a, a two hour discussion as opposed to one minute, um, Mr. Rodifer, but as we think about Vermont and kind of what they're doing well, where else can we be looking for guidance on from other jurisdictions who are being more efficient and effective at moving away from gas more quickly? Uh, well, I mean, you know, there, there are things happening in Massachusetts, New York, California. One thing that's interesting that actually we've talked to Commissioner Thompson about is in Denver, they have a waste uh, heat extraction system where you take um, uh, you, 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 the, the heat that's in sewage is, uh, is you use a heat pump. By the way, the, the, the sewage is never, it, it never touches any, anything. So I don't want to, I don't want to get anyone confused and think there's any sewage involved in this. Uh, and it, it, it's essentially a heat pump, but it's more efficient because the, 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 the sewage heat is much hotter than the air or the ground. Maybe not hot is the right word, but warmer. So you can, you can extract heat from it um, and, and use that to heat buildings. So that's one example of the kind of thing we've done. I know Commissioner Thompson actually was in Denver and wanted to tour the facility. I think he was unable to, but but um, so uh, there are a number of places doing different innovative things. Um, and, and DC, you know, usually is on the vanguard when it comes to climate uh, stuff. We were the first place to have 100% uh, electricity for 100% renewable sources. We're really kind of behind on gas. And this is where we need not just the council, not just the, the commission, but also the council to, to step up here. Okay, well, thank you so much. I know I'm out of time this round, um, but Ms. Chatterjee, if you're still here, very concerned about some of what you shared um, and we'll be following up with the government witnesses today as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto, and thank you to each of the witnesses for taking the time to provide testimony this morning. We're gonna transition these witnesses and bring on a new panel of public witnesses. I think we're beginning with Michelle Hall. So I'll give uh, staff just a moment to make the transition. I think we can begin while staff is, is continuing to transition people onto the panel. Uh, since I do see uh, Michelle Hall present, we will begin with you and good morning to you. Thank you for beginning, uh, for being here this morning with the committee. You can begin your testimony. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Council Member McDuffie and Council Member Pinto. My name is Michelle Hall and I'm a member of the Washington Interfaith Network through Varick AME Zion Church, which is located in the River Terrace Community, Ward 7. And I'm also an active member of the River Terrace Community Organization. Working with WIN has actually been an awakening and, and an educational experience. Uh, in our neighborhood, most of the houses were built in the 1930s and the 1940s, so we know the majority homes have uh, gas stoves and we're utilizing a lot of gas in this community. We had a, a small team of us had uh, went block to block in the community checking for gas leaks. And what we discovered that was the majority 
uh, blocks had gas leaks, some small volumes, some high, high volumes. One um, block in particular had a high volume of uh, gas leaking. And we, to the point that we actually called 911 and we called Washington Gas. We did not get a response from Washington Gas. However, 911 did show up and were very, I don't wanna say nonchalant, but not responsive in the way you would have thought they would have been. And they were saying if the volumes were just a little higher then we would actually do something about it. Our question was like, ha ha, you wanted to get at the explosive level. So that wasn't your best experience. And we also, I also followed up by calling my Ward 7 uh, office council member, uh, Vincent Gray, and we did get a response from his, his office. The concern here we have is that um, nearly several uh, DC, first of all, has the single high greenhouse population sources is coming from a lot of the furnaces, the boilers, the water heaters, which are powered by methane gas. A lot of houses like my house, I do have a gas stove and I, do, I did not realize the impact that it could have on my health until working with when, which informed me, you know, on the headaches and the, uh, dizziness, possible risk to uh, lung disease. But I did have an opportunity to work back in 2001, 2002 alongside, uh, alongside the Sierra Club when we went door to door, when we had the issue with Pepco. We went door to door checking with residents, seeing how many people were impacted with asthma, cancer, bronchitis. And, the, and the, the rate was alarming. So many household people had asthma, they had bronchitis, family members had cancer. So we do know the hazardous impact, gas and other facilities like a Pepco plus being near uh, a highway can have on a person's health. We want to, the goal is here to hopefully transition from gas onto a healthier, um, healthier uh, means for a cleaner environment. Okay. The concern, I, my, is my, my minutes up, but I wanted to also say um, we need to increase the hospital since you're gonna have all of the, um, if we're gonna have all of what, what is going on that's adversely impacting our health with the gas and air pollution, you have more residents now and less hospitals. We need to create hospitals to accommodate the health concerns of the residents and not just urgent care. Okay, I thank appreciate you. it. And thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, just a quick reminder, I know uh, I've only gotten more efficient in, in trying to make sure I got all the windows appearing on my screen, but there's a blue sky timer uh, that alerts people to the amount of time that you have. And each person has three minutes to testify. Uh, I really appreciate your testimony. We want to hear it all, uh, but we also want to be mindful of all the other witnesses who would like yes. to testify this morning. So thank you so much for your thank testimony. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, we're going to go next to Rose mm -hmm. Leah. I'm going to make the call. I don't see the name, but I want to make the call just in case. Uh, and then we'll move to Alyssa Hackerson, uh, whose name and video I do see. And good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie and Councilwoman Pinto. I'm Alyssa Hackerson, a parishioner at St. Augustine Catholic Church in DC, the chair of our social justice advocacy ministry and a Washington Interfaith Network leader working on the Green Healthy Buildings campaign. My Catholic Christian faith and a deep love for DC that stretches back to 1988 my freshman year at American University, compels me to plead today for policy that prioritizes healthy people and a cleaner environment over profits for Washington Gas and any other energy slash construction company that wants to use tax dollars to continue profiting off of unhealthy carbon emissions. Care for the earth is a fundamental ten tenet of my faith and I believe of utmost concern to you, DC's elected leaders as well. The Council on Foreign Relations notes that methane has more than 80 times the warming power of the greatest greenhouse gas emitter, carbon dioxide, over the first 20 years after it reaches the atmosphere. 
but it breaks down quicker than carbon dioxide and is mostly gone from the atmosphere after about 10 years. So cutting methane now is an efficient way to reduce the harmful effects of climate change in just a decade's time. I hope that you'll agree that the environmental challenges connected with methane gas emissions have fundamental health, moral, and ethical dimensions, and the need to remove methane from DC's buildings and homes cannot be ignored. For example, a recent Stanford University study estimates that methane emissions from gas stoves in the United States has a climate impact comparable to about 500,000 gas-powered cars driven for a year. 500,000 cars. Methane gas seeps into the air even when stoves are not turned on. In DC, three quarters of the climate disrupting greenhouse gas emissions comes from buildings. Children in homes with gas stoves are 42% more likely to develop asthma. And I have to wonder, since kids in wards eight are 10 times more likely to visit the hospital because of asthma, how much of their illness is connected to methane in their homes, their school, or in their community? Clean Energy DC, your bold legislation committing to greenhouse gas emissions reductions of 50% by 2032 and net zero, emission, net zero emissions by 2050 is evidence of the district's commitment to care for people and the environment. Considering Clean Energy DC's goals, I just don't see how fossil fuels can remain part of the city's energy portfolio. After spending many months with my Washington Interfaith Network environmental group focused on measuring the methane gas emissions flowing from the city streets, I just don't see how fossil fuels can remain part of the city's energy portfolio. And I hope you can't either. Will you pass legislation directing the Public Service Commission to implement an equitable transition from gas to cleaner, healthier, renewable energy in homes and buildings? Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to testify today. And thank you so much for providing your testimony here this morning. We're going to turn next to Teresa Hopgood. And good morning to you. Thank good you. Good morning. We can use Thank you. Uh, good morning. And uh, thank you, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Washington Interfaith Network WIN regarding the effective functioning of the Public Service Commission. My name is Teresa Hopka. I'm an active member of WIN through the Church of the Epiphany located in Ward 2 of the District of Columbia. As a leading regulator of utilities in the district, the Public Service Commission has an important role to play in combating the climate crisis. A third of global warming comes from methane emissions. Methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. With the health and safety of our residents and communities in mind, our WIN team of volunteer leak detectors in 2021 surveyed all four quadrants of the district to identify methane leaks. During our surveys, district residents raised concerns about the implications of the glass leaks we had discovered. I was particularly struck by the reaction of one resident in River Terrace, located in Ward 7. He was riding his motorcycle and stopped to ask us if we were checking for gas leaks. He immediately pointed in the direction of what turned out to be a major leak a few yards away. One could not mistake the strong gas odor coming from the pipeline below ground. No DC resident should smell gas in their communities. We deserve a city that is clean, green, and safe. In light of this harmful discovery, what responsible and fort-leaning actions should be pursued next? We do not support a solution that calls for building significantly more methane gas pipelines. Cleaner and safer alternatives exist. WEN is eager to help provide for safe, healthy lives for district residents today and for years to come. This aligns with the district's goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by the next decade. We want all of our children and communities across the district to thrive and to breathe clean air. That is a part of WIN's vision for an equitable future. Will the council hold the Public Service Commission accountable for doing its part in achieving a healthy green environment for all. 
That concludes my oral statement. Thank you, Chairperson McDuffie, for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you so much for uh, your testimony. We're gonna turn next to Jim Beck and good morning. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Hello all, uh, <clears throat> my name is Jim Beck. I come here as a longtime DC resident of Ward 4 and member of the Washington Interfaith Network through my church, Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church in Ward 2. Thanks for the chance to share my story and why I'm convinced we need the council to move on further legislation to help our city decarbonize and do it quickly and equitably. Over many years, I've been inspired and convicted by my faith that we need to do better to one, look out for all our neighbors and to be good stewards of our home, this earth. Over just as many years, I've been on a journey to figure out what that means and how to do it. Well, after learning from Wynn and others over recent years about how methane gas is not only bad for our climate, but bad for public health, I got the fire under me to make some changes. So first, what did I learn? I learned by burning fossil fuels, we are not only fouling our air, we are contributing to climate change, hurting us, our neighbors here and around the world. Okay, so we gotta do something about fossil fuels. Here in the district, three, three quarters of our climate disrupting emissions come from buildings. Okay, we gotta do something about buildings, I guess. Then came the kicker. I learned that cooking and heating with methane gas, which we've been told is the environmental choice, right? Can actually create smog-like conditions in our houses. Children in homes with gas stoves are 42% more likely to develop asthma. Okay, so gas can contribute also to indoor air pollution that hurts our kids? Wait, there's more. Through the uh, gas detection, leak detection work of my friends at Wynn, I learned that gas is leaking all over the city. To fix it, Washington Gas wants, as you've heard, to spend four to five billion dollars to replace every single pipe in the district. So indeed, we have an expensive infrastructure choice before us. And I think instead of buying into a failing system that is tremendously damaging to the climate and the health of all our families, we can invest in infrastructure we all need for the future. That's what I learned. What am I doing about it? When I, my radiator broke last winter, I saw an opportunity for myself personally. This year, we made the call to get off gas altogether, which ain't easy here in DC with old houses, with gas boilers, uh, water heaters, uh, stoves, et cetera. It ain't cheap either to make the switch. I'm happy to say we got off gas in January. The day our induction stove was installed, the, the, the wash and gas technician removed the meter. But so what? One privileged guy is able to get one house off gas to protect his family, my family, and try to contribute to climate solutions. What about all the other families? That's what we got to do. We got to invest in helping out all our neighbors across the district make the transition, make it fast. Status quo is unacceptable. Methane gas we burn in our homes is not only bad for the climate, but for public health. As you heard, the gas infrastructure is crumbling. Now is the time to rise up and move on a fast, just, just and equitable transition to the future. We need our elected leaders to hold PSC accountable, to benefiting me and my neighbors first, not the utilities approaches of the past. Will you prioritize legislation that ensures DC will have a speedy and equitable transition? Thanks much for the chance to, to, to visit with you all. And thank you so much for your testimony. We're gonna move next to Barbara Briggs. And good morning to you. Thank you for being here. You can begin your testimony. Hi, good morning, uh, Congress members McDuffie and Pinto. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Barbara Briggs. I'm testifying today on behalf of Friends Meeting of Washington's Committee on Peace and Social Concerns. Uh, our Quaker meeting is a member of the Washington Interfaith Network, and we also partner with the Sierra Club and Interfaith Power and Light on climate issues. You've heard from uh, many of my colleagues this morning about the health and climate impacts of so-called natural gas and about the investigation on gas leaks that over 50 of our volunteer researchers from houses of faith and climate organizations across DC have carried out. I've submitted our report for the record and I hope you'll read it along with my written testimony. But right now, I'd just like to talk for a minute about how our leak investigation effort got started and why we are here. Uh, just before the pandemic shut down in March of 2020, some of us had the opportunity to meet with Commissioner Richard Beverly of the Public Service Commission. And I asked Commissioner Beverly about the PSC's plans for getting off gas. What was the time frame? How were they thinking about sequencing? How would they manage this transition? 
And we were shocked when Commissioner Beverly responded that there were no plans for getting off gas, despite the fact that decarbonization is a matter of, of DC policy and it's what we need to do to do our share to combat climate change. He said that uh, the Public Service Commission's job was to keep the industry to keep Washington gas healthy and economically robust. And how would that, how could that possibly be done if they couldn't sell gas? Uh, he went on to say, no timeline, but he went on to say that um, if PSC were to work on, that they wouldn't be allowed, the PSC would not be allowed to uh, work on transitioning the utility off, off gas toward clean renewable energy and that they would need a mandate from DC council in order to do that. And if they had that legislative mandate that they would uh, definitely of course go ahead and implement it. Um, we had also asked the public service commission for leaks data, which they routinely receive from Washington gas about the leaks that are called in from all across the district. And we knew there were a lot of them. At first we were told there's no problem, we'll send it right over. Then we were told a little bit later, no, actually that's confidential information. It would be illegal for us to share that. It is not allowed to be shared with DC residents. Uh, so uh, we decided that we would take a look for ourselves and we bought this small handheld industry grade uh, leak detector. Our first leaks foray was on uh, February 7th. We went uh, around the neighborhood around Friends Meeting of Washington with a group of our Sunday school kids. It's War II. And on Florida and Avenue and S Street, about a block away from our Quaker meeting, we found a leak that measured 50, uh, that measured 100% of the lower explosive limit. Uh, in other words, potentially explosive. And that's the highest measure that our little detector is able to measure. So it could have been bigger than that. You, in your the last time year- expired. Uh, I know you're, you're providing yep. testimony. We'll, we'll have a round of questions after all the witnesses sure. had an opportunity to testify. And I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to expound on what you're saying, because I do have a question specifically for you based on uh, some feedback from the last witness panel. Um, okay. okay, very good. All right, thanks. Uh, we're going to turn next to uh, Rabbi Michael Warbo. Good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Good morning, and thank you, Council Members McDuffie and Pinto. Good morning. I'm Rabbi Michael Warbo. I serve to Ferris Israel Congregation in Shepherd Park. On January 17th, the Jewish ecological holiday of Tu B'Shvat coincided with Martin Luther King Day. On that day, seven to Ferris Israel families walked around our neighborhood of Shepherd Park with a gas leak detector. Right across the street, we documented a dangerous methane leak, the highest level the device was able to measure. I join the many voices you're hearing from today of people who've had similar experiences. Everywhere groups tested, they found gas leaking. DC residents identified nearly 400 gas leaks, including over a dozen, that, like the one we found near 16th and Kalmia Northwest, reached the level at which an explosion is possible. The Hebrew Bible, forbids lifne iver, putting a stumbling block before the blind. The commentator Rashi suggests that at any time someone exploits an imbalance of information between themselves and others, they are violating this rule. DC residents cannot see methane leaking when we walk through our neighborhoods. And this invisibility has been a stumbling block to reckoning with this problem. The leak detection device that we used in January made visible to my community what we had not been able to see before. Now we can see the Public Service Commission has placed a stumbling block in our path. DC residents have been told gas leaks are exceptional when we now see that gas leaks everywhere, that pipes are in the ground. The PSC places a stumbling block before us when we experience pipe replacement, sorry, when expensive pipe replacement is proposed as a solution, when we see that even brand new pipes would also leak because gas leaks from the gas drilling sites we currently depend on, from hundreds of miles of pipelines, from the pipes beneath DC streets and running into our homes, gas leaks. 
The Public Service Commission places a stumbling block before us when it refers to this fossil fuel as somehow natural, rather than simply saying plainly that it's a methane gas, a climate super polluter. If my community is to be true to the teachings of both Tu Bishvat and of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we cannot accept the continued obstacle that methane infrastructure places in the path of our city and its people. I'm calling today for the DC Council to pass legislation directing the gas utility to stop obscuring the risks that gas imposes on me and my neighbors. Instead, we must immediately begin the transition off of fossil fuels and towards clean energy. Let's commit to telling the truth, to sharing information, to seeing clearly, and to a future where we live in ways that do not damage our climate or harm our health. Thank you. And thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Ahmed, Ahmad, uh, Ahmed, I'm sorry, Ahmed Abdul Malik. And good morning to you. Uh, very nice to see you, actually. Uh, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you for joining us this morning. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Ahmed Abdul Malik, and my family attends Masjid Muhammad, a member of the Washington Interfaith Network in War 5. I care about the environment because my faith says hum human beings enact the divine will in their divinity, divinely instituted role as Khalifa or caretakers of the earth. So that means we should take care of the gas leaks as that would be the right thing to do to help the planet. When our Boy Scout troop decided to do a service project by looking for gas leaks around our masjid, we found lots of, of leaks in the neighborhood. We called in the gas leaks we found into the Washington Gas Company. I want to live in a city that is clean and healthy, which means there won't be any leaks. I learned that methane gas is not only small toxic, but is, but is bad for our community's health and environment. My vision of a healthy community is people respect the earth and don't smell gas in their streets. Will you make legislation to make cleaner and healthier neighborhoods? Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, hopefully you can stick around. I don't know if you've got school. I don't want to hold you up if, if you've got to get back to class. But uh, I, I want to take an opportunity to really thank you for, for testifying. We don't often get uh, – I don't want to make any assumptions about your age, but uh, but how old are you, Amit? Oh, I'm 14. 14. Well, thank you. Uh, what grade are you in? Oh, I'm in eighth. In eighth grade. Okay. Well, look, we don't often get eighth graders providing testimony to the Council of District of Columbia, certainly not before my committee. Um, and so I do appreciate you taking the time uh, to do so. Uh, it is very effective tool to convey concerns to uh, your elected officials and I emphasis on your elected officials because we represent you as well as, as the, the other residents across the District of Columbia. And so we wanna hear from you and your friends and the people in your community uh, as much as we wanna hear from anybody else uh, in the city. Uh, you are just, just as invested in, in the city, it's gotta pour into you. And so thank you for taking the time to provide your testimony. I don't know if you provided it in writing, but we'd love to have your written testimony to make sure it's part of the record, okay? Okay. All right, and uh, make sure you tell your friends all about your testimony. And, and, and maybe even think about encouraging them to, to provide some testimony as well and writing, even if they can't do it virtually. I really do appreciate it, but I haven't said it already. Um, next, we're gonna see, actually, I'm not sure if, if Dr. Lewis Tate Jr. is present. Uh, no, uh, let's go to Madison Mayhew, who is. And good morning to you. Thank you for being here. You can your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Madison Mayhew. I use she, her pronouns. I live on Capitol Hill. I'm a member of Calvary Baptist Church and work to help D.C. congregations of all faiths take action on climate change through interfaith power and light. A week from today, my church and many others will observe Ash Wednesday and begin the 40 days of Lent. For me, Lent is a reflective time to count each day mindfully aware that we are but dust and that this connects us with the soil, with each other, and with all living things. Counting can be a sacred business, and it was with a sense of purpose that so many DC residents went walking in their neighborhoods with the gas leak detector and systematically counted the gas leaks they detected in their neighborhood over the past year. What did they find? 
First, they found many gas leaks. This map depicts one stretch of North Capitol Street Northwest on which we detected 45 separate methane leaks. Altogether, our groups documented ne nearly 400 gas, gas leaks in all wards of, um, of DC. Second, some of the leaks we found were dangerous. Here's a picture of last February of children from the Friends Meeting of Washington finding a leak that hit the highest level the detector could measure a block from their congregation. All told, our teams found a dozen methane leaks that are already at the level where an explosion is possible. Finally, we are mindful that our solutions will need to include everyone in DC. This is a picture of Ms. Rosalie, who is testifying today from Varick Memorial AME Church, who tested for gas leaks with residents of Bending Terrace Housing. Ms. Edith Floyd and Ms. Brenda Perry are standing in front of her apartment that serves as a community food pantry. We cannot replace leaking pipes on the backs of a low-income folks, nor can we propose that only DC residents with the money to do so will be able to purchase safer solutions for themselves. We demand a safe and sustainable future for DC that brings everyone along together, leaving no one behind. It should not have fallen to church volunteers, Majid youth groups, and synagogue volunteers to begin to take an accounting of the gas leaks in Washington, DC. But now that they have stepped up to do this necessary counting for all of us, the council must act on what they found. We call on the DC council today to immediately direct Washington Gas to set a timeline for the phasing out of all fossil fuels and for a just transition to clean energy. Thank you for your time and consideration. And thank you uh, for your testimony this morning. Uh, we're gonna turn back to Dr. Lewis Tate Jr. Thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Tate. You can begin, you can unmute yourself, turn on your video and begin your testimony. Right. Thanks for being here. Uh, good morning, uh, Councilmember Duffy. Thank you so much. I think I, I heard the young man's testimony. I think I pushed the wrong button, you know, with Zoom. Sometimes you get confused. But first of all, I want to say, I'm Dr. Lewis Tate, a pastor, church called The Village in Ward 7. And I live in Ward 5, which is your ward in Trinidad. And I am a Washingtonian. I was born in Freedman's Hospital. What I'd like to say is um, I'm also a part of Washington Interfaith Network called WIN. I'm very involved in an organization that does a lot of work in our city, particularly in, in Wards 8 and Ward 7 and all across the city. One of the things that may be not apparent to some is that the issue of ecology and environment are not always topics on um, uh, certain groups sort of conversation. Um, but I think the importance of this conversation to me is that when is helping to educate people in these two wards and across the city about these issues. And I've been involved with environment issues for quite some time when I passed in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1993. I remember um, helping to organize some residents against an incinerator they wanted to put in their neighborhood. So I know how important it is. And so, and also climate and climate change and environmental issues uh, adversely affect particularly African-Americans and people of color, because a lot of times uh, things are done in their communities that they're not aware of, or they're exposed to things that uh, disproportionately affect them. And so we have residents who are renters, not owners, um, and they relied on landlords uh, to protect their health and help them sort of move off gas. And the thing is, we I have solar in my home. I have solar panels on top of my roof. I have a all electric home. And uh, I know we grew up with gas, but I think it's time that we look at how we can make our planet safer for everyone. And I think this is an important issue. And I'm glad that uh, that uh, you are hearing us today. And remember, WIN is sort of a multicultural, multi-ethnic um, organization. So there are a lot of people um, across the spectrum who are concerned about this issue. And thank you um, for your time today, uh, Councilman McDuffie. And thank you for your testimony this morning, uh, Dr. Tate. And thank you for all the witnesses on this panel for taking the time to provide testimony to the council. I, I wanna take an opportunity to talk a little bit about engagement. I asked the previous panel about 
how um, uh, the organizations uh, were engaging uh, the various communities across District of Columbia. Uh, and I wanted to get a sense of, you know, uh, sort of clear theme of this testimony about uh, the gas leaks across District of Columbia and uh, the request to uh, have the council push the Public Service Commission uh, to do more uh, to address these issues and to uh, uh, really hold Washington Gas accountable. Uh, and, and I wanted to know more about uh, you know, the sorts of voices that are at the table and, and how you all are, are you know, really making sure that it's representative of the beautiful diversity that exists across the District of Columbia. And so uh, one of the previous panelists said, make sure you ask uh, Barbara Briggs about this. Uh, uh, in, in addition to Barbara Briggs, uh, I want to hear from some of the other folks too. I think we lost Rose Lee, but you know, uh, I know that River Terrace community very well uh, and had friends growing up who lived over there. And, and so, uh, you know, Dr. Tate mentioned that you are a native Washingtonian born in, in Freeman's Hospital. Uh, you know, not always the types of uh, people who are, are, are really testifying about these environmental issues. And I really pushed our government agencies and, you know, others who are doing work with the government, DCSEU comes to mind, uh, to make sure that they're doing more to reach across the District of Columbia so that everybody understands the benefit of some of the uh, policies that exist, some of the programs that are funding uh, some of the initiatives. Dr. Tate, you mentioned that you have solar. Uh, and yes. a lot of folks are, are, are you know, putting solar, having solar install, installed on the rooftops. Uh, and I want to see more people who, who understand, particularly minorities, who are understanding the benefits of these types of programs. So I'll throw that out there to, to you all. And I'll begin with Barbara Briggs, uh, since it was mentioned last panel, that we should uh, definitely ask you that question. Uh, but anybody, I would love to, to, to hear weigh in. I know how important historic St. Augustine's Catholic Church is to uh, the District of Columbia in general, but into to, to Black Catholic community, of which I'm a part. Uh, I know how important it is as an institution. So I would love to hear from you too, Alyssa Hackerson, in terms of just your involvement, the community in which you all are sort of bringing into this conversation and 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 who's at the table uh, helping to make some of these decisions. Barbara, um, can, we make Duffy, can we make Duffy? If I could go before Barbara, because Barbara has a lot more to say than I do. <laughs> sure, that's fine. Um, I'm just very- I don't know about that, but sure, you can go before. <laughs> he does. We're She's long-winded maybe. <laughs> right, right. Um, so at St. Augustine's, we our school's in the process of getting solar on the school. It's been a long process, but that's coming. Um, as a social justice min, um, advocacy ministry chair, I am making a concerted effort to make sure that our parishioners know about solar for all. I'm a little concerned to find out what I heard this morning in the previous panel, that solar for all is struggling paying people or something's going on there, I have to look into that. But I will also like to say that, um, we met, when met with the Office of the People's Council back in November, and they are, um, I, I think, advocates for making um, the, the transition possible, and they're aware of the equity issues, and they also have concerns about, from the meeting that we attended at when, our WIN group, um, they said it's going to take 30 to 40 years to get off of gas, um, but they also said it was Sarah, I think it's Sarah... She's an attorney there, Kogel Smucker, said her concern is that most people don't know what a conduction oven is. They don't know about the big changes that are coming. And at St. Augustine's, we're, I'm very concerned, our pastor, uh, Father Pat, is very concerned that our people don't know enough. So anything that um, this that PSC can do, that the council can do, council can do to broadcast the efforts that we are we need to electrify. Go ahead, Barbara. And I'll just, sure. before, before uh, Barbara Briggs goes, I, I want to just say uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, but the, the Office of People's Council also uh, plays a role, and, and they, you know, really, you know, in my experience, uh, have been good at engaging with the various community organizations, civic associations, advisory neighborhood commissioners, and other uh, constituents across District of Columbia to engage and share some of the information that's going on. Uh, uh, in terms of the business before the Public Service Commission and, and really being an advocate for consumers uh, uh, 
in terms of the matters that that are pending before the Public Service Commission. And so if you all haven't had an opportunity to speak with folks at OPC, I would suggest that you also uh, do that uh, when you have the opportunity. Uh, Barbara Briggs, care to weigh in? Sure. Uh, first of all, um, I, I am so appreciative of your concern for diversity and that all the voices in DC are heard from. Uh, it's That's very shared. Uh, Friends Meeting of Washington has had the, the privilege of working with the Washington Interfaith Network and the Interfaith Power and Light, which represents dozens of churches, synagogues, and mosques across the DMV area. Uh, Washington Interfaith Network alone represents uh, over 40 uh, houses of faith including many east of the Anacostia, uh, including Varick Memorial Church, um, which you heard about this morning. Uh, Pastor Green of Varick Memorial has been extremely involved in, uh, in this project and in fact has submitted written testimony. Uh, Pastor Bill Lamar of uh, Metropolitan AME is also very involved with this effort and has really brought this issue of transition from fossil fuels into his effort at Black Equity Through Home Ownership, which he's kind of heading up. Um, so I think that might answer part of your question. I mean, what we are seeing is very broad-based concern about both the climate and health impacts of gas, the fact that there's a sort of a, a policy vacuum in terms of getting DC off gas, and the fact that the Public Service Commission has asked for a mandate from council evidently needs one. And so our request right now would be, please provide the Public Service Commission with a mandate, a requirement to engage with this and move DC off all fossil fuels, but particularly gas efficaciously and speedily and in a manner that's just and doesn't place additional burden on DC's low income uh, residents and communities of color. I uh, appreciate uh, that, that feedback. That's really helpful. And I appreciate all your testimony. I'll throw, not that you all don't have enough on your plate, but I, I will throw uh, onto your plate uh, something that I've raised consistently in, in my nearly 10 years on the council. Uh, that, you know, uh, some of the concerns that have been raised by communities that, that uh, are in and around uh, uh, Ward 5. Uh, Dr. Tate, you mentioned that you, you are a Ward 5 resident. Yes. Uh, and Power DC right now has been pushing and coordinating with residents who live in Brentwood uh, because of all the industrial uses that uh, impact that community, including uh, a more recent proposal that would move uh, a number of uh, yellow uh, Aussie school buses, gas power school buses into a community that already has and bears a huge burden of industrial uses uh, in and around that neighborhood. I'm not sure if that's something you all have heard about. Uh, I appreciate all the efforts of the ANC commissioners and the, and the civic leadership uh, in Brentwood. Uh, and frankly, they've been fighting the fight uh, for so long with the uh, trash transfer station, the three of them that, that exist in and around that neighborhood. Uh, and, and they have salt domes, they have uh, DPW dump trucks, they have uh, other government uses that really play uh, that community. Uh, and we don't typically get a lot of folks who come down and testify about these issues. And so when the council proposes to move uh, all these buses into that community that's already impacted, uh, I, I'm frequently the sole voice on the council who speaks up uh, for those neighbors. And I would love to have a more of a diverse constituency of uh, people understanding uh, about the plight of communities like that, that have been impacted by, um, I think, government decisions that were made decades ago, uh, but nevertheless, uh, most burden uh, minorities and people of color and communities of color uh, who don't always have the resources, uh, despite the efforts of the elected officials like me and others to, to push back on some of these things. So uh, just add one more thing to y'all's plate. Uh, uh, I know that uh, you all are very organized, clearly. Uh, the theme was a central theme of the, the, all these witnesses uh, today, and I, and I hear you loudly and clearly. Uh, Councilman, uh, 
May sure. I say something? Yeah, please. And then yes. I'll turn um, I'll say your hand yeah, because I'm a resident of, of Ward 5, as I said, and I pastor in Ward 7. And I'm very concerned about these issues, uh, not just locally, but also nationally and globally, because it is, um, you know, the more incidents of, of asthma and um, different kinds of things that affect our communities. And, and I think, too, perhaps we can have further conversation to figure, because I'm a Ward 5 member, find out I mean, when we are doing, uh, educating and doing stuff. But it was, certainly would um, be helpful to sort of put our heads together to figure out how we can uh, get more information out to uh, disadvantaged communities who are normally not involved in these kind of conversations so they understand the importance of it. And I also think, too, it would... Uh, uh, in terms of your own fight and what you've been doing, uh, then people can kind of readily see, okay, you know, Councilman Duffy is, he's really, this is an issue that's near and dear to his heart. So I think it's important, and you know, to figure out how we can, because I hear what you're saying, that there's not enough of, 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 of particularly African Americans who really understand, I mean, they are affected by it, their health, um, and, you know, all kinds of things, housing, all kinds of issues. But sometimes they don't they don't really know how to attack this issue or what really is actually going on. That's why when is so important. But we also need to work in collaboration with you and your office and, and others who are concerned about these issues as well. Certainly. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Tate. Uh, Barbara Briggs. And then I want to call on. Uh, yeah, just really quickly. Um, I really take to heart what you're saying about the, the it makes no sense for the district to be investing more money in, in fossil fuel dependent vehicles, for instance, the buses you're talking about, um, and, and the, the fact that that really impacts frontline communities, communities in those neighborhoods is, is important. Uh, it's going to take money to do this transition, but there, the, re the, the technology is available. There are electric buses. We need to buy them. We need to buy them quickly so that those neighborhoods are not affected by the emissions. Um, there's Washington Gas and its fossil fuel multinational Canadian parent, Alta Gas, uh, wants $4.5 billion or thereabouts in the next 10 years to do wall-to-wall -wall virtually pipe replacement for an, an energy system that needs to go away. Let's take that money and use it to buy electric school buses, electric transit buses up our grid, you know, and help uh, the owners of low income, you know, low income and moderate income home and building owners do the transition because it is going to cost money. But once we do that, we are going to have an energy system that will serve us, that will have our families healthier, um, that will ultimately be more economical, that will provide more green local jobs than the fossil fuel system provides. And we can provide data for that. I mean, there are very good studies well, indicating that. Before I turn to Ms. All, I wanna just, you mentioned jobs and, and more economical. I think part of the conversation, I would love to make sure that you all are having, and please feel free to reach out to my office. Uh, this committee is the Committee on Business and Economic Development. I've been a champion on racial equity and closing the racial wealth gap in the District of Columbia. Part of the conversation that we should always include when we're talking about these issues uh, is making sure that more minority-owned women-owned businesses are doing some of the work. Uh, when you're talking about, you know, installing the solar that, you know, St. Augustine's would like to put on its rooftop and, and some of the other homes, uh, what kinds of uh, minority-owned businesses are involved in that work? Uh, if you all help me advocate for that, uh, th these folks are are, are are running businesses and typically uh, they go out of their way to hire people who live in these communities uh, that have been pushed to the margins and, and, and frequently are less well-resourced. Uh, and so I think the, the multiplier effect of making sure that minority and women-owned businesses in the district are a part of the equation as you're uh, uh, doing some of this work around the city, uh, I think is also important too. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw yet another uh, thing on you all's plate. And I'm gonna turn to Michelle Hall. I saw your hand up and then I wanna ask, Ahmed about uh, how he got involved in some of this work and, and what the council could do to, to really engage uh, him and, and some of his friends. So Michelle Hall first, and then I'll turn to uh, Ahmed uh, after this. Yes, 
as a member of the River Terrace Community Organization and a Varick church member, Varick and River Terrace a lot of times have worked alongside with one another. Awareness is key and we know that clean air should be a basic right. We have dealt with David and Goliath situations numerous times throughout our community with Pepco, with Shell, with the hydrogen stations. The first, that was the first hydrogen station that had ever been placed in a residential neighborhood. So we've been guinea pigs. But you asked earlier about how do you disseminate or get the information out. Our community has monthly civic meetings and so during those meetings, we're able to, to make the residents aware of various uh, or essential information and important information that could possibly be detrimental to you know, any environmental issues. We always talk about concerns at our community meetings. So that's one way we get out the information, but we also have monthly newsletters that are disseminated by the block captains because we do know organization is important. It's important to be proactive and not reactive. We've galvanized numerous times for protest demonstrations and testifying at, at hearings. So our community really works hard to unify and to speak out against any environmental or social injustice that we see or deem as important. And that's what I, I wanted that. to share. That's very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and then I'll turn uh, to Ahmed uh, just to let me know how, how you got involved uh, in this. Is, and, and also, is there anything that you would like the council to do beyond uh, um, this particular issue to better engage you and your friends with some of the issues that are impacting our environment. Okay, so um, I got involved in uh, this by, uh, uh, had, like, like I said, I had gone on a group um, with uh, Barbara Briggs. She was also in the group and like, she like showed me like how to check for gas sinks with the device that she had. And um, some things that I think we could do to like um, maybe like convince uh, people to like uh, stop using gas is to like maybe use electric stoves and electric fireplaces. I appreciate that. Uh, again, thank you very much for your testimony and spending some time with the council this morning. Uh, you did a great job uh, and, and it's really helpful to the work that we do down here at uh, the Council of the District of Columbia and on this committee in particular. Thank you to each of the witnesses for your testimony here this morning. I really do appreciate it. We're going to shift next to our panel of public witnesses for the Office of People's Council. Um, and Kay Brisbane, Philip Kowalski, Teresa Smith, Sandra Seegers, Ed Lazier, Chris Weiss, Victoria Leonard. Take a moment just to transition those witnesses onto the panel, and I will be back momentarily. Okay, I uh, see some familiar faces from this next panel popping in. Um, is, I see, okay, the first witness, Kay Brisbane is here. Good morning to you. Thank you for being here. You can begin your testimony. Good morning, Councilman McDuffie and Councilmember um, Pinto. My name is Kay Brisbane. I live in Ward 5. What would you do if you woke up in the middle of the freezing cold night to find your radiators cold? 
Would you know where to turn if the gas supplier refused to accept responsibility for the out outage or to fix the problem? Yes, three months in the dead of winter with over 15 days without heat. Without the advocacy and focused efforts of Ms. Cheryl Moss of the Consumer Services Division of OPC, I would have had to leave my home. I'm here today to publicly praise the efforts of OPC in the handling of this ongoing issue with Washington Gas. My first contact with OPC was remarkable in that my call was answered promptly and my problem listened to politely. My call was transferred to Ms. Cheryl Moss in the Consumer Services Division. She became an instant advocate. On Saturday morning, two weeks ago, it was 22 degrees and for the fifth time in three months, my heat was gone. I left, I left Ms. Moss a phone message explaining that I had no heat again and that I had called Washington Gas and been told by an employee that that was not an emergency and I would have to call back on Monday. She immediately contacted the gas company and got them to send a team of technicians to get my heat on. She has taken the time to understand that the antiquated low pressure gas line to which my home and several others in this area are connected is the problem. Rain, water and snow melt leak into the main line which causes the gas to be shut off to our homes. She knows that the gas company has not connected our homes to the high pressure main that is already in place. And she has enlisted the aid of the OPC's legal counsel and encouraged me to file a complaint with the Public Service Commission. Ms. Moss is tenacious in dealing with Washington Gas. It is clear that the OPC exemplifies public advocacy at its best. It is what you hope to find at a public service agency and when you do, even monopolies are forced to respond. Please note though, after listening to testimony from the first group of panelists, that my, my suggestion and concern is one, that we're breathing and continually being exposed to methane gas. I did not know that before this. So the issue around publicizing the concern is a major one, Councilmember McDuffie. And secondly, it would seem to me that it, as you begin to develop legislation that provides the mandate that you've been requested to for the Public Service Commission, that you include in that, that is an issue of equity. The communities that have survived the onslaught of people moving into our communities, the people who have been here for years and years, be given priority in terms of providing the transition and whatever costs are have to be absolved, that the city absolve as much of it as possible. People who have been paying taxes forever have gotten the short end of the stick. We were told when we asked why it is that we cannot be put on an existing high pressure line so that we don't experience these outages is that we live in the wrong side of town. And that's coming from people who work for the Washington Gas Company. So clearly they have information. And I think that in fairness to people who have suffered for so long, they for a change, the council needs to support us. Thank you very much for listening to my testimony. And I hope you and your committee will join the OPC in getting this monopoly supplier to do the right thing. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we're gonna go next to Philip. Kowalski, but let me just say in response, there's no wrong side of town uh, in the District of Columbia. And I don't know who at Washington Gas said that, but if you've got a name, uh, I would love it for you to share that offline with the committee. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Philip Kowalski, you are next and you can begin your testimony. Good morning to you, thanks. Good morning, Councilor McDuffie, and thank you to everyone who has spoken before. Um, I'm a resident of, of Ward 4. I've lived here for three years. I'm not a, a DC born um, from Ohio, but uh, I'm here because uh, in December of 2020, I received a water bill that was $1,600. Typically, my water bills run to be about uh, $100. Um, when I called uh, DC Water to, to, you know, to inquire about why it was so high, they very straight face just told me um, that it was a uh, it was a correct reading and 
and that, uh, yeah, they would send uh, somebody to look at the meter to make sure it was correct, but they were absolutely sure it was correct. And, and, and indeed, when they sent somebody to, to do a, a meter reread, they stuck with their story. And they claimed that I used all that water, that it was a controlled use of that water, that it wasn't a leak, which is insane. And they offered absolutely no evidence for that. Um, I did some research and I saw that in Ward 4, there is a history of households being charged extortionate water bills. Um, and it hit me that I should contact uh, Councilwoman uh, Janice Lewis George, which I did. And her office very kindly put me in touch with the Office of the People's Council uh, to fight this bill. Now, this went on for about um, six or seven months. I would call the, the, the DC Water Company um, organization. I would, uh, you know, try and walk through what was going on, try to explain to them that I didn't use this water, and they would insist that I used $1,600 worth of water, which I would have to pretty much open a water park in my house to use that much water. Um, they really wouldn't drop it. I thought I was going to lose the case. It was going to go to court, but then Stephen Dudick of um, DC Water, um, got, uh, of the Office of People's Council, got involved. He's a lawyer there. And he contacted DC Water. And a few days before the court case was supposed to happen, um, it was dropped thanks to Mr. Dudek's um, um, support for me. And and from in he very you know carefully got you know looked through my case, looked at the evidence, and and laid it out to to DC Water. And they dropped it. But what I want to say about this experience is that I, I I'm lucky. I was able to get support from Mr. Dudek and I knew to, to contact them thanks to Janice Lewis George's office. But I can't imagine how many other people there have been besides me who have gotten these extortionate water bills and who have been forced to pay because they didn't know what kind of resources they had available to them. I hope this never happens to anybody else. And um, I'm so thankful for, for Mr. Dudek and for the Office of the People's Council and Janice Lewis George. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate your testimony this morning. And I uh, want to turn next to Teresa Smith. And good morning to you. Thank you for being here. You can begin your testimony. Good morning. Successful investigations, resolutions, great professional and personal understanding of consumers, and a job well done to the Office of Poli the People's Council. It's a wonderful day in the District of Columbia to testify concerning the accomplishments of OPC. My name is Teresa Ann King Smith. I'm a current homeowner of over 30 years, ward eight resident for over 50. And I retired from a law firm a couple of decades ago, but it's important that you know that OPC was my advocate. Let's celebrate. I'm a senior and a member of the Congress High Senior Wellness Center, and OPC was there to tell us about what they can do for us. And later on, they told us some things virtually. During the pandemic, I applied for the LEAP program and the UDP um, Application Center, and I always send my stuff through certified mail. Oh boy, did I get the runaround. I called Ms. Rashida Boyd, and she was poised and sprang into action. Not only did I send the documents to her that I sent in 2019, but I filled out some more in 2020. And she was able to get positive response from the Department of Energy and Environment. She also said, what should I do in addition to help Ms. Smith now? It's not what happened last week, last month, or last year. Well, DC Wasser and Pepco accounts were secure. I had no worries because I'm considered a big mama if you hear the noise in the back because I help essential personnel during all this by providing daycare free of charge because you want somebody that can take care of your children. And you know, without water or Pepco, I wouldn't be able to do it. Anyway, I did continue to make some payments, but not the amount requested. I couldn't pay hundreds of dollars a month because I'm retired. But with everything going on, DC's emergency funding being depleted, they were able to assist me in benefits for PEPCO. But Ms. Boy, even though I was, my case was officially closed on August the 9th, navigated me through other paperwork 
so that the thousands of dollars due to DC Wassa was paid. They subsequently found out that I didn't owe that much money because how many times can little tykes go to the bathroom? I wrote a letter of thank you for her fantastic professional and heartwarming service to Ms. Boyd. In my personal opinion, not only should they continue to receive the amount of funding that they have in the past, but it should be increased. Uh, I also would like to say on a personal note that Ms. Boyd was able to speak with me during the pandemic and she did learn that I was helping. My model is what can you do for me now? I was working with the district government by making sure that the central personnel were able to go back to work because if they didn't have childcare, our um, home care workers, I have some people that work as social workers in the nursing homes. They couldn't go, they couldn't leave their two, three, five year olds home. So sure. I didn't have a real daycare, but they knew they could count on big mama, grandma at any time. If you well, have any questions, please ask me. Uh, I will certainly ask you if I have any questions. I wanna first thank you for that energy uh, that you provided and maybe bottle it up and send some on over. And <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you uh, for being here and providing that testimony, uh, Teresa Smith. We're gonna turn next. <laughs> to a familiar face, uh, Sandra Seegers, uh, who uh, is here this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Uh, you are muted. I'm, I'm tickled because I'm gonna start by saying I don't have the energy. That's a hard act to follow. So let me do what I do because I can't do that. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was fun. Um, I'm a Ward 8 resident. I have attended community meetings where Sandra Fry and her staff has done presentation to educate the community on its rights as it pertains to the utility companies. They go above and beyond the call of duty for the residents of DC. They have been able to get utility payments deferred and late charges removed. They also assist residents in getting financial assistance with their bills to avoid disconnected services. There's one particular case where in Ward 8, a senior uh, with serious health problems was behind in her bill, specifically the Verizon phone bill, which was part of a package deal with the phone and cable and internet. Reverend Anthony Motley and I contacted the Office of People's Council. I spoke directly with Linda Jefferson from OPC. She did all the legwork necessary to have her Verizon bill paid. OPC worked out a payment plan with Verizon, discussed with the resident the best package plans used on, on her need, for her needs and income. Office, Office of People Council connected the resident with their community partner, the United Planning Organization, UPO, to help with financial assistance. The fact that OPC attended the short-term and long-term needs of the senior helped immensely, allowing the resident to put more time and attention to her health challenges. OPC reflects what good excuse me, oh, oh, I had to change pages. OPC reflects what good government looks like because that is what good government does. They are citizens, citizen focused. They are accessible, attentive, effective, and with forethought of the long-term impact. They are not like many agencies who step away from the situation after merely giving their citizen a phone bill, a phone number. Additionally, is there any way you can provide financial assistance with telephone service and internet the same way there's financial assistance with electric gas and water from the government for the seniors and the income, low income families? Um, and I wanna speak on the uh, situation I had years ago with the water department. My bill is normally, at that time it was low, it was about $20 a month, a quarter really at that time. And one day I got a $300 bill. I refused to pay it because I knew it was ridiculous. So back then um, I contacted them. Was, that was my first time hearing of them. And they stepped in and they made them come out, fix the meter, because the meter was broken. And the water department said, well, go ahead and pay the $300 and you won't have to pay a bill for a couple of years. And I said, no, I'd rather keep my money in my pocket. Just pay you what I need to pay you. So they are a big help um, for everybody, anybody and everybody to know about them and be able to contact them for help. They will help you. And thanks for listening. 
and thank you for your testimony this morning. We appreciate it. We're going to turn next to Ed Lazier. It is good to see you. Good morning to you. You begin your testimony. Good morning to you as well, Chairman McDuffie. Thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to testify today. My name is um, Ed Lazier and a Ward 5 resident, and I am also a member of the Office of People Council's Utility Consumer Advocacy Network. Um, the Office of the People's Council plays, as you know, an important role in representing the interests of DC residents and utility customers, as you've already heard uh, in this hearing, uh, weighing in on a wide range of utility issues. Um, they represent the interest of me and other ratepayers before the Public Service Commission and other regulatory bodies. And as a result, uh, in, in those roles, OPC plays an important role to support affordability, equity in the delivery of service, and pushing the district to live up to its climate change. And that's what I want to testify a little bit about today is, is to, uh, my support for those roles and, and encouraging them to do more and whatever the council can do to support the office to do that. Um, I appreciate that the Office of People's Council created the Utility Consumer Advocacy Network, giving me and other members of the community an opportunity to weigh in on the OPC agenda and help disseminate its information to DC residents. Um, the things that I'm most like supportive of or related to OPC are its work to support uh, energy affordability, uh, both educating residents about what's available and then advocating for more energy affordability. So OPC studies around water and energy affordability with a focus on lower income households have been important. I know that OPC has played a role in this pandemic to help make sure that residents have um, can get connected to assistance, whether that's LIHEAP or state, state EC or other forms of assistance to pay for energy bills when they could not because of the pandemic. And I um, um, know that OPC has played an important role in the pandemic to support moratorium legislation to prevent cutoffs of utilities and water uh, during the pandemic. In addition, OPC has taken steps to be a leader in supporting efforts to address climate change. We certainly heard from the panel before around the Public Service Commission, really uh, a need for the council and other and all actors to play uh, an active role in pushing um, our utilities to move towards uh, uh, renewable energy and addressing uh, the climate crisis and making sure that we're doing our part. OPC has created a climate action division, giving them the staff and the ability to focus on this issue. Uh, they have focused very much on that climate change is an environmental justice issue and is pushing the Public Service Commission and, and others to make sure that we are thinking about equity when we are addressing the impacts of climate change, knowing that communities with high levels of un unemployment and poverty are also those that are most affected by climate change. And they've weighed in um, specifically to push PEPCO uh, to make sure that utility climate change plans are centered around equity. Uh, they've weighed in with the Clean Energy DC Omnibus Act, advocating that the Public Service Commission put a numerical value on equity, again, pushing the Public Service Commission and last year, OPC held a community conversation on climate change and environmental justice. I appreciate all these efforts and just wanted to speak up in support of them, encourage them to do more, encourage the council to support this office as much as possible and to play its role in supporting OPC's efforts to, around energy affordability and climate change. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next uh, is Chris Weiss and good morning to you. Good to see you. you can good begin morning. Good morning, everybody, Chair Chairperson McDuffie and staff. My name is Chris Weiss and I direct the efforts of the DC Environmental Network. I'm also honored to serve in the Office of People's Council DC Utility Consumer Advocacy Network. I'm here to share decent thoughts on the performance of the DC Office of People's Council. In recent years, it has been a pleasant opportunity to come before this committee or send testimony and share how constructive and meaningful the network's working relationship with the OPC is. Over the years, we have been striving to communicate together increasingly in the nexus between consumer protection and climate mitigation and adaptation. Our DC Environmental Climate Crisis Movement and OPC need each other to make sure climate equity and environmental justice are reality as the district tries to do what it can to reduce carbon emissions and prepares for the worst impacts of the climate crisis. OPC recently gave the DC Environmental Network a voice on their DC Utility Consumer Advocacy Network that serves as a forum for sharing information and perspectives, including us in this consumer protection conversation is appreciated and helpful as we try to engage the pressing climate crisis. Last October, the DC Environmental Network took part on a panel at OPC's community conversation, the price you pay straight talk about climate change and environmental injustice. 
Last December, People's Council Sandra Montevis Fry participated on a panel at the DC Environmental Network's Next Big Thing Climate Crisis Conference, along with representatives from the Council and Executive Public Service Commission and Climate Change and Resiliency Commission. OPC has been growing their internal infrastructure to include a climate action section and have sponsored important educational webinars on issues like how to prepare for flooding. The DC Environmental Network agrees with OPC's climate resiliency principles, including equity requires that resiliency measures benefit consumers in all eight wards. An essential component of an effective climate resiliency plan is energy affordability. Flood insurance requirements must be affordable and equitable for all district residents. Consumers must be educated about the impacts of climate change, mitigation measures, and climate and flood resiliency options. Decent is committed to engaging conversations and collaborative efforts alongside OPC to engage equitable climate crisis policies with DC consumers in every ward. The climate crisis is here. The district, the region, and the planet is not even close to being able to push back against the latest United Nations emissions gap report prediction of a global temperature rise of 2.7 degrees by the end of the century. The status quo cadence of climate crisis policy development and implementation in DC and across the globe will lead to economic and environmental failure unless we work together. The strong climate crisis engagement and collaborative spirit of the Office of People's Council makes Deason hopeful that we can, for example, eliminate polluting gas from our homes and have a shot at reaching our climate crisis mitigation and adaptation goals in our nation's capital city. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, this morning, we appreciate it. We're going to turn to our final public witness for uh, the Office of People's Council, and that is Victoria Leonard. Good uh, to see you this morning, and uh, you begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair McDuffie and Council Member Pinto, um, if you're here. Uh, thanks for holding this hearing. I'm Victoria Leonard, and I'm the political and legislative director for the Baltimore Washington Laborers Council. We are the local affiliate for LIUNA, and we rep represent more than 7,500 members across DC metro area. And many of our members live and work in the District of Columbia. And like uh, the, the two previous um, speakers, I am also on the UCAN, and I represent the construction trades. And OPC established the UCAN about four years ago and I'm proud to say that I've served on the UCAN since its inception. And as you heard from Ed Lazier, the mission of the UCAN is to keep OPC staff informed about utility consumer issues and concerns. And despite the obstacles created by the pandemic, the UCAN has continued to fulfill its mission. And thanks to technology, we've been able to meet via video conferencing and in fact, we have a meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, March 2nd. And as one of LIUNA's frontline points of contact with OPC and as a member of UCAN, I'm confident in saying that OPC does a great job representing the interests of DC residential ratepayers. For example, OPC recently established a climate change section that is focusing on equity issues as the district seeks to implement its clean energy plan. And the climate change section recently issued an equity assessment to help guide the city's electrification efforts. And this assessment was done by the Applied Economics Clinic and includes a number of recommendations to ensure a just transition. And I'm sure um, OPC um, Sandra Fry will will be talking about that in her testimony. Um, ensuring a just transition is really important to Layuna, and that's because the shift to electrification means a shift away from natural gas. And we heard on the earlier panels um, a, a very strong desire to shift away from natural gas. Layuna members perform most of the gas pipeline replacement in the district, and so this shift to electrification means that their jobs are going to disappear and become obsolete. And so it is important that the jobs supporting the distribution of electricity are just as good as the jobs supporting the distribution of gas. And the formation of OPC's climate change section group helps ensure that the equity lens 
includes job quality. So in closing, OPC does a first class job representing the district's residential rate payers. Under Sandra Fry's leadership, OPC is an effective and important counterbalance to the power of utility companies. OPC staff is accessible, skilled, and forward-thinking as the formation of the new climate change section demonstrates. Um, thank you, Chairman McDuffie, for holding this hearing. All right, uh, and thank you to each of you for taking the time out of your schedules to provide testimony about the Office of People's Council. Let me just ask, generally speaking, um, in your interactions with uh, the office, um, uh, and they've obviously taken on more things over the years, but Memorial to you, some of the, the work they're doing in their water division, uh, and, and you, know, uh, you just mentioned, Ms. Leonard, the work that they're doing with the, uh, the climate change section. Uh, do you all think they have the resources that they need to be able to do this work and, and to help the district meet its climate goals through its advocacy on behalf of uh, its customers? I say no. I think they need their budget increase um, because when they helped us with the lady with the Verizon bill, that wasn't in their scope of work, but they did it anyway. They didn't okay. form partners. They've gone out their way to form partners outside of the government. So they need money in the budget so they can go to the government, and get it easily um, to pay the phone bills for their, their constituents. And I, see I also agree because of the fact that Miss um, Boyd actually had to take it upon herself on her own time to find other resources at that time to take care of my DC water bill because the DC um, benefit funding was exhausted. And it's hard to explain what well, we're going to research if Ms. Smith actually uses it. It's either you have it or you don't. But she was very, very adamant about helping me. And this way, it wouldn't have taken an extra four or five months for her to complete it. Or either uh, she had other um, resources outside of uh, the government and in the community. So I applaud her on that. And I'm sure she's not the only one that did something like this. Okay. Anybody else care to weigh in on that? I mean, I, I would just add that this is one category. Oh, sorry, Victoria, I'll be quick. Uh, that um, where a little bit of money in, in public spending can go a long way, whether it's hiring a staff person to assist, you know, literally hundreds of, of residents who need help or, uh, having a lawyer who can, um, you know, weigh in on regulatory issues that have an impact on all of us, hundreds of thousands of people. It's just an efficient, really uh, important use of DC resources. And in that way, I think anything you add to OPC will make it a much stronger agency and help us all. Okay. I would agree with that. Um, they can never have enough resources, especially in addition to the need to hire uh, staff attorneys and um, consumer helpers. Um, there's, they also need to hire expert groups like the Applied Economics Clinic who did the, the study for them on um, climate change and equity. So it's important that they have um, enough resources to do the job well and um, be, be a strong counterbalance to the utility companies. Okay. Kay Brisbane, you have your hand up, and then I'll, I'll yes. go twice after that. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to add that one of the big issues I found in researching the issue that we have in my three block area is that there are at least, so far, seven people, seven home owners that are having the same issue that I'm having, a loss of heat because of, of cracked pipes. None of the people I talked to knew that they could go to the Office of the People's Council to get help. I think that's a big issue, especially in our community, where there are many older people and many people who just have never had that kind of interaction with public entities. So if they could get funding for more outreach, I think that would be great. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Chris Weiss. Thanks, Chairman. Um, you, you had a, a really wonderful uh, stream of questions related to outreach. You know, how do we get the word out? We talked about the gas testing and, and all the different groups involved in that. Maybe you can ask Sandra if she needs money for to increase th that, that or other types of outreach. 
on, on all these issues on water on energy. Yeah, I'll ask you, I'll, I'll tell you, sometimes you have, uh, it's not often, but you do have some agencies that sort of victims of their own success. And I feel like um, whatever the resources they do have, uh, OPC is one of the agencies that manages to really engage in a way uh, that I don't always see from other agencies. In fact, I think in a way that I would like to see uh, more from other agencies. And so um, I, I will ask for that though, uh, to see if they need additional resources on the engagement side. So that's And fair. that would be excellent. As I said, that we have a proactive director at um, Congress High Senior Wellness Center. So mm -hmm. OPC comes regularly, once, okay. twice a year. And I'm thinking about all the other centers that I've had to go to and say something about or in um, religious communities. It should be a way that we can, you know, reach out to all eight wards. You're right about that. And I appreciate that. And thank you each for your testimony one here one, uh, this one evening. Thing, one more thing here. Um, uh, sure. You could have one, one briefly. Quick, yeah, quick. Sure. I'm glad you noticed that they do more than other agencies. The rest of them give you a phone number and they through with you. <laughs> well, that's obviously uh, uh, not what is required of people who are public servants, uh, particularly uh, taxpaying residents who depend on services. So uh, I appreciate you pointing that out and thank you all for your testimony. We're going to transition to our next thank panel you. of uh, public witness. Did, did I miss somebody? Okay. No, uh, I just said thank you. Oh, you bet. Thank you as well. I appreciate it. We're going to channel uh, our next panel of public witnesses for uh, the... Like we are going to go to nice seeing you again, Sandra. You too. You still have the energy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Are we transitioning out? Yes, I think they're going to put us back in the other room. Yeah, they don't want us to go. All right, I'm going I'm to ask you all to go ahead and mute yourselves because we're actually no, going to start. No, they don't want us to go. We're going to start with the, uh, with the next panel of public witnesses for the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration. And while uh, staff is transitioning uh, those witnesses, I will just mention that uh, the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration, or ABRA, uh, has a mission to support the public's health, safety, and welfare through the control and regulation of the sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages in the district. ABRA conducts licensing, training, adjudication, community outreach, and enforcement efforts to serve licensees, law enforcement agencies, advisory neighborhood commissions, civic associations, and the general uh, public so that they understand and adhere to all district laws, regulations, and ABRA policies. Uh, let's begin with Naima Jefferson is the first person on the public witness list. Uh, and good morning to you. Can you and, hear me? Uh, good morning. I can hear you. We can't see you. I don't know if you want Hi. to take the video. Good morning, uh, Council Member McDuffie. Um, I first wanted to say uh, thank you to the ABRA staff, uh, particularly I would like to thank Ms. Jenkins, uh, Ms. Sarah Fashball, as well as uh, some of the ABRA investigative staff for their work um, with myself, as well as with our community. Um, but I also wanted to express some concerns that I have today sure. um, re regarding um, ABRA regulation and how it uh, appears to be unequitably enforced. Um, oftentimes we notice in communities um, with higher minority populations that um, the enforcement and the penalties seem to be um, more lax and there seem to be many opportunities for establishments to uh, come back into compliance than in other parts of the city. Particularly if I were to give the example um, of the big board, um, there was an issue, I think everybody is familiar with that case um, in, in which they violated um, the mayor's order and there was, um, ABRA had moved to um, do a closure. We've had establishments in our community in Ward 4 
who have done it more than once and ABRA never moved to remove um, their um, license, um, nor did they threaten any closure. Also, uh, several years ago, um, actually pre-pandemic, we had a establishment in our community that had over 27 violations. MPD had been there um, more than 600 times in a two year renewal period. And what was really frustrating for our community was um, that the board itself would not um, revoke the license immediately, but waited into the renewal season. And I think that's excessive. Um, it's, an, it's an unreasonable amount of uh, violations to have when you should be uh, applying by the law. Also being a border community, um, there is disparity between how Maryland enforces um, their liquor license uh, process in DC. And so often what we have is establishments that cross the border because they've been thrown out of neighboring Montgomery County and they come into the District of Columbia and they bring their clientele from Maryland and all their issues that uh, some which are public safety issues and that are detrimental to peace, quiet and enjoyment of our community. Um, and then we're left as a community and, and individual residents to document and police them because we're at the edge of the city. And when we do make phone calls, you know, it takes a long time for someone to come from um, the Reeve Center all the way up to, you know, Eastern and Georgia Avenue. Um, we've also most recently um, had some establishments who have tried to circumvent the application process. And so, you know, I would just like to see greater enforcement um, and more um, standardization and equity across the city in how um, alcohol licensing is done. Uh, thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony this morning, uh, Ms. Jefferson. We're gonna go next. Uh, I don't see Paula Edwards uh, on this panel. So if, if the person is available, they can be transitioned over. In the meantime, um, we will go to Felicia Danzler, who I do see uh, is with us this morning. And good morning to you, good to see you. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman McDuffie and committee members. My name is Felicia Dantzler, president of Ask Me Local 2743, and I represent approximately 38 members at ABRA. These members work as licensing specialists, investigators, records management specialist, and legal administrative specialist. My appearance today is to share with this committee labor's experience with the agency over the past year. With the ever-evolving COVID crisis, the agency has not been exempt from positive test results. The agency quickly alerted employees impacted and these employees were placed on COVID protocol. Many of my members had their telework increased from two days to four and work was getting done. The only drawback was not knowing confidently that the workspace was sanitized after a positive test was learned. The agency provided provide sanitizing wipes, disinfecting wipes, sprays, gloves, and masks at each workstation. The past year, management and labor had a few challenges with one matter resulting in a grievance. We met at a, at a defining moment that either the director takes the position of tribunal loyalty or does he do the right thing. Director Musali understood and moved with swiftness to a mutual resolution. Labor believes the director demonstrates true leadership. The director has promised to commit to working with the union and that every employee will be treated with dignity and respect. This is not happy talk, but a true commitment from management and labor to solve problems and collectively look out for one another. I know historically this is not how this should be, but it is working at ABRA. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I am available for any questions, comments, or concerns. And thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, next, we're going to go to Commissioner Salim Adolfo. Uh, good morning to you, Commissioner. Thanks for being here. You begin your testimony. Greetings. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, shall I wait for the clock to restart, or I can just keep going? Uh, it's, it's, that, you can keep going. You can get some okay. extra time that way. All right, cool. So uh, I like to begin with echoing many of the comments that our first uh, person, our first witness gave, uh, Ms. Jefferson. You know, we're fighting a battle here in Ward 8 dealing with a lot of uh, issues that we're starting to see in other spaces in the city, a lot of gun violence. 
And in our community, there's a lot of gun violence that seems to always be around the liquor store. We know a few years ago, there was a young brother that was shot right at Holiday Market, uh, right in front of Holiday Liquors on um, Memorial Day weekend. Um, last summer, we had a young girl who was shot right in front of Mart Liquor uh, last July. Um, both of these stores have been cited through Abra's own investigation for selling alcohol to minors numerous times. Most recently, we had Spar Liquor, who was cited by Abra for selling alcohol to a minor, even after checking ID in all of these different situations. And so looking at the mayor's health equity report, it stated that, I, I, I want to read the blurb very quickly, is that stresses of living in neighborhoods with inadequate access to economic and educational opportunities has flagged as indicative of trauma at the community level. Reduced community safety in the district is correlated with gaps in health promoting community resources. Evidence shows that factors such as lack of jobs, racial and economic segregation, concentrated poverty and high alcohol outlet density negatively impact community safety, quality of life and neighborhood quality, as well as the likelihood of violence. Within our commission, within the corridor of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, there are at least five places that sell liquor. You have two uh, class A liquor stores within walking distance of each other within a few hundred feet. I mean, it's Abra has the uh, code, I think is maybe 500 feet apart, but they're just a, a, a few feet uh, from that uh, threshold. And they're next to stores, they're next to, uh, excuse me, they're next to schools, they're next to the colleges, next to the park. And we're picking up excessive trash, it's the gun violence, it's excessive numbers of calls to service. And it's as though the Abra board does not acknowledge that and see that, that as a contributor to the violence in our community. We've had numerous residents sign petitions, sign letters, actually have physical protests out some of these spaces. And even the chief of police closed Mark Liquor because of its ability to keep contributing to the violence in our community. And so my testimony here is to ask that we, we look at how the Abra Control Board makes its decisions on which establishments can stay open or not stay open. Because we, we, <laughs> the battle that we're fighting over here doesn't help when we have stores that sign up to say we won't sell alcohol to minors and do it. And then we see the level of substance abuse in this community. We see the level of domestic violence and we know that alcohol is a big contributor to that. And I don't wanna blame the liquor stores for all of these things because people have to be held responsible too, but we're all here in this community together. And I would caution Abra to think about the licenses that they allow to have in high concentration in this community, especially since we got a homeless shelter right next door. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Uh, turning next to Mark Lee. Uh, good morning to you and uh, you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Council Member McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, Council and Committee staff. My name is Mark Lee and I serve as the coordinator of the DC Nightlife Council, a local nonprofit trade association and business membership organization representing bars, restaurants, nightclubs, and entertainment venues of all types and sizes located throughout the city. DCNC will separately submit a written statement and we thank you for inviting our organization to share a performance evaluation for the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration at this oversight session. As you know, the past two years have been devastating for local nightlife hospitality establishments. The district has lost a significant number of both community beloved and long contributing venues to permanent closure and many more establishments are currently teetering on the precipice of financial unsustainability. Both you, Council Member McDuffie and Council Member Pinto, the Committee on Business and Economic Development and the entire DC Council have earned our great appreciation for supporting our city's nightlife business community by expanding service expansion opportunities during the partial shutdown period and initiating the streetery program and for allocating financial assistance for local establishments in order to allow venues to continue to significantly contribute to the economic development, fiscal health, and social and cultural landscape of our great city. Equally appreciated has been the outstanding performance by ABRA throughout this extremely challenging period. 
Director Musali and the entire agency leadership team have demonstrated an unparalleled commitment to imagining, advancing, and stewarding both fundamental operating modifications and innovative new approaches to best assist our city's largest hometown business sector, primary employer, and major economic contributor that a series of mayors and CFOs have consistently calculated as measuring approximately 17% of the district's overall economic activity. Nightlife hospitality establishments interact with multiple district agencies on a regular and ongoing basis. Among those agencies, ABRA is the most accessible, best performer, performing, better communicating, and represents the business supportive standard to which other agencies should aspire. These factors are why the agency has been awarded well-deserved national recognition by multiple state government organizations for their commendable service and exemplary operations. The district is fortunate to benefit from both the regulatory compliance management and the public policy innovations provided by ABRA. In addition, the agency is a collaborative partner with the enterprise community by both intention and in function. We look forward to working with ABRA, the Committee on Business and Economic Development, the DC Council and Mayor Bowser to continue examining additional regulatory reforms to ensure that the district's nationally recognized and uniquely independent small business nightlife business community has the opportunity to survive and thrive. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. I'll make a call for Rabbi Jeffrey Kahn who I do not see, uh, but if, if uh, is available, we can have him turn just in Dover. Uh, I want to call. I am here. Edwards. Oh, you are right there. You're right in front of me. But you know, let me let me call Paula Edwards first because sure. we had some trouble uh, transitioning. No worries. Over and so we'll call Paula Edwards since you've been waiting for a little bit and you were number two on the list, and then we'll go back next to, to Rabbi Jeffrey Kahn. So if you want to unmute yourself and turn on your video, Paula Edwards. Um, I'll leave the video off because I'll lose the sound if I do the video. Okay, all right. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council, Member Mc Council Members McDuffie and Pinto for hearing my testimony today. <clears throat> and thanks to Sandra Kavinsky for getting me here. I'm a resident of Ward 4, native Washingtonian, and because another witness gave a shout out to Freedman's Hospital, I was born at the old Columbia Hospital for Women. <clears throat> I'm here to testify as to my experience in interacting with the staff of the Alcoholic Beverage Regulatory Administration. I found them to be professional, hardworking, impartial, and dedicated to the mission of ABRA of supporting the public's health, safety, and welfare through the control and regulation of the sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages. I suppose the mission statement should be updated to include cannabis. <clears throat> Excuse me. The training and assistance provided by ABRA helped both the regulated community and the public at large. I'm appreciative of the sessions conducted by Ms. Fassbaugh and others for the education sessions and their help in understanding ABRA rules and regulations. Ms. Martha Jenkins has, purported, has provided sage and even-handed help, even late on Friday evenings, and is a wonderful resource. ABRA investigators have ventured into areas that are sometimes dangerous and pursue their work with knowledge and professionalism. I would like the council to address the enforcement and regulatory discrepancies between the District of Columbia and surrounding Maryland counties that adversely affect border communities such as ours. I would also like the council to provide more funds to ABRA so that they can scrutinize applicants more closely and that burden does not fall upon the public when it protests bad actors who are trying to set up in their communities. This will only increase as, reg as recreational cannabis enters the regulatory realm. ABRA has to have the regulatory and enf enforcement tools to protect the public safety in conjunction with its mission, while not unduly burdening the regulated community. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Now we're going to turn to uh, Rabbi Jeffrey Kahn. Thank you for your patience and good morning to you. you can begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie, Council Member Pinto. My name is Rabbi Jeffrey Kahn, speaking today on behalf of my wife, Stephanie, and son, Joshua. We're Ward 4 residents and own and operate Tacoma Wellness Center, district's first licensed medical cannabis dispensary, which God willing will celebrate its 10th anniversary next year. You will soon hear from Yvette Alexander representing the position of the District of Columbia Cannabis Trade Association, whose remarks we fully support. 
2021 was the first full year that ABRA served as a regulatory agency of DC's medical cannabis program. The good news is that for a government agency, ABRA is truly top notch. Director Musali, his staff and the ABRA board are approachable, accessible, responsive, demonstrate a real appreciation for the challenges we face and have made a real effort to help us resolve them. The bad news is that the same first year with ABRA saw the number of DC patients registered in our cannabis program plummet. We are falling well below the critical mass necessary to maintain our program. Why? Because our patients, before they can walk in the door, they must first see a healthcare practitioner for a recommendation and then apply to ABRA for a card. Those who visit the dozens and dozens of businesses that call themselves I-71 compliant simply don't have to do that. Seeing a doctor and waiting for ABRA, the two major barriers to dispensary access are investments of time and money that a lot of people are just no longer willing to make. Instead, they can go to I-71 establishments without either a doctor's note or an ABRA card, and increasing numbers, they are doing just that. What do we need? We need the option of self-certification added to the list of acceptable healthcare providers. In addition to physicians and dentists and naturopaths, folks should be able to self-attest to their intended medical use of cannabis. We're delighted that ABRA and the council have agreed to precisely that type of self-certification for people like me, over 65. We need it for all adults, especially veterans and folks who receive SSI for whom the out-of-pocket expense is simply prohibitive. And we need to allow dispensaries to enter DC patients into ABRA's metric system ourselves. The requirement to send an application, an application off to ABRA for processing can be eliminated by dispensaries entering patient information into the system directly. Currently, dispensaries call ourselves for out-of-state patients. We want to be able to do the same thing for DC patients so our program can grow and thrive and we can all celebrate with ABRA this time Rabbi next Khan, year. You're well over your time. I wanted to... I think you had a little extra time there, but I want to turn to uh, the next witness. If if we could have, I'm told, I'm not sure if Stephanie Khan and Joshua Khan actually plan to testify. They're on the list. No, but, they won't be. Okay, got it. Thanks. Um, we'll turn then to uh, my uh, former colleague, Council Member uh, Yvette Alexander. Good morning to you. Thank you for being here. And uh, you can begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, Chairman McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. I'm Yvette Alexander. I'm a consultant for the District of Columbia Cannabis Trade Association. Linda Mercado Green is the chair. Um, the association was formed and they represent legally licensed medical cannabis dispensaries and uh, cultivation centers in the District of Columbia. Since October of 2021, the medical cannabis program has been under the regulation of ABRA and the association has been pleased overall with this move. However, we are still concerned with the steady decline of registered medical patients under the program and the overwhelming increase of illegal cannabis businesses in our city. Currently, the medical program has over 6,000 actively registered patients, only about half of them have purchased at least once in the month of January, with the registration stagnant since before the inception of the COVID-19 pandemic, and monthly patient participation at only about 60% of the active registered. Recent provisions from ABRA have made, may provide some temporary relief, may provide some temporary relief, but it will not stop the decline and possibly the collapse of the medical program in the district. We look forward to working with ABRA, with you, Councilmember McDuffie, and we have some recommendations. A comprehensive approach regarding the DC medical market is imperative. We recommend beginning this approach by repealing the current ABRA registration process and replacing it with a simple self-certification form for patients 21 and over, similar to the form recently released by ABRA for patients 65 and older. The current requirements are time consuming, burdensome, outdated, and expensive. As a result, the illegal market 
is roughly 17 times the size of the legal market, bringing in $600 million annually to the legal market's 35 million. Dispensaries would provide ABRA with the patient information collected at intake and the customers could be, could be tracked through metric, the system. So all that information would be there for them, but the patients could go directly to a dispensary and get rid of all of that bureaucracy and the long time it takes to register through ABRA. A second priority is civil enforcement for illegal businesses operating under the incorrect claim of the I-71 compliance. We know I-71 does not refer to businesses. It only refers to home grow, home purchase, and home share. The recommendation is to impose civil infractions. And I want to repeat civil to landlords and business owners. This would not involve any criminal penalties. And it would also not result in any jail time, only civil infractions and the taking away of these licenses, these basic business licenses for these operations. We also want to um, we also want to um, stress that these businesses could still be able to apply when the market opens up. That we would welcome them into the legal cannabis market. The last suggestion is to eliminate the sliding scale report. This report is unnecessary and outdated um, since the inception of the metric system. It also includes, oh, the metric system currently has all the patient information included. Um, we find this practice of the sliding scale report to be in violation of HIPAA regulations. And it also um, is discriminatory because it singles out subsidized patients. Um, we realize some of these um, suggestions may have a fiscal impact, Councilmember McDuffie, and we are willing to work with ABRA um, to address any fiscal concerns. The association members have even agreed to make that those fees to make those costs up, um, imposing an increase to their fees. So I welcome any questions that you may have and thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> thank you for your testimony. We're gonna turn next to Frank Chauvin. And good morning to you. If you wanna unmute yourself and turn on your video, if you care to do so, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Yes. Uh Good morning. Or I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Actually, good morning. Um, uh, Chairperson McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, and uh, members of the committee. My name is Frank Chauvin, and I've been serving as a volunteer community member of the ANC 1B Alcoholic Beverage and Regulations Committee in Ward 1 for two and a half years. Uh, the area of our purview includes the areas of 9th Street, uh, U Street, parts of 14, and parts of 14th Street, which have a very high density of alcohol licenses. Um, ABRA has a very strong public affairs outreach staff and my committee members, uh, community members and myself are very happy with the provisional response to our frequent inquiries, specifically their staff member, um, uh, Sarah Fashbaum. Uh, such requests for information uh, on ABRA and ABRA licensee activity usually takes a day or less uh, to, to obtain a response. However, it is some of the internal operations or policies and procedures that I am here to provide some focus on today. First, some comments on the ABRA board operations. First, Ward 1 is woefully and fully underrepresented on the ABRA board. There is no Ward 1 board member serving on the board, and therefore the voice of my community is an underdog with respect to our interests in specific high volume of licenses. Please help the mayor's office understand the importance to have a Ward 1 appointment to the board on the next absence. Secondly, ABRA refuses to consider and apply DC code 25-314, which states whether issuance of the license would create or contribute to an overconcentration of licensed establishments, which is likely to affect adversely the locality section or uh, portion in which the establishment is located. Currently, ABRA refuses to uh, acknowledge this important code. And uh, I ask that uh, ABRA oversight uh, of this matter be reviewed. Uh, it adversely impacts uh, my neighbors in my residentially adjacent neighborhood very heavily. Uh, so I appreciate uh, your, your review of this matter. Uh, two more items, uh, license um, uh, hookah use and sale. 
Well, the allowance for smoking by commercial patrons is not permitted by DC law, except for the seven or eight venues which have applied for and received exemption from this prohibition from the Department of Health. There are many, many hookah bars ABRA licensees would operate outside the law. These clubs expose many dozens of staff members to secondhand smoke in opposition to the very DC code, which has prohibited it. With many dozens of hookah lounges being operated by ABRA licensees and ABRA continues not to take their responsibility in issuing a violation for their licensees activities, it is urged that ABRA work directly with the Department of Health to reconcile their current indifference and blind eye. Uh, lastly, um, ABRA complaints. Uh, too often, ABRA complaints go lost, unanswered, or have a very slow response. There is no, actually no reason the ABRA complaint line should not have a service order number, such as when every resident calls 311, they have a service order number, it can be tracked, uh, just uh, which provides a strong customer service paradigm. ABRA is urged to adopt such a system whereby each complaint is taken fully and uh, being able to be followed up by a resident who too often feels left out of the process and unsatisfied and uh, goes away with a, uh, a tail between their legs uh, because we're not getting the service we deserve to put uh, bad operators on notice and, and uh, change their ways of operations. Uh, thank you very much for your ears today. I'm, I'm willing to uh, here to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next is Chris Conrad and good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie. Uh, thank you for giving me the time to speak this morning. Um, I'd like to discuss the, the agency's involvement in the licensing process for alcohol distributors, uh, and specifically liquor stores in underserved communities in Ward 8, uh, where I live. So uh, just a brief bit of background, my exposure to ABRA involved working alongside Chairperson Adolfo to protest the renewal of a local liquor store's distribution license in Ward 8. Uh, prior to that uh, protest proceeding, the store had played host to at least seven shootings, including one that claimed the life of a 15-year-old student at a nearby school, Maurice Scott. This spate of violence was an impetus for our protest, but not the comprehensive basis. Uh, we uncovered rampant liquor law violations, drug distribution, violent crime, property crime, etc. Uh, all this went to the appropriateness standard and showed that the store could not carry its burden. But I'm not here to uh, relitigate the protest proceeding, uh, which renewed the store's license and allowed it to continue to serve as hotbed of violence. Uh, to note, two days ago, there was another shooting right on the block. Uh, that relitigation is ongoing in the D.C. Court of Appeals right now, which is reviewing the actions of the agency and the ABC Board for Procedural Due Process and ANC Act violations. Uh, instead, I'm here to highlight the agency's institutional shortfalls throughout the process, which uh, really seem to pervade protest processes. When the chairperson and I first discussed the prospect of filing a protest, Abra's legal counsel uh, discouraged us. They cautioned, and I quote, license revocation does not occur except in the most egregious circumstances. That's not the correct legal standard and only operates to discourage meaningful civil discourse in the community. Uh, undeterred, we filed a group of five protests in parallel with Chairperson Duffo's own protest. Uh, and one of my neighbors was unable to make the status conference that was held initially due to a criminal court appearance. Our petition was dismissed and I had to file a motion for reconsideration uh, in order to get it reinstated. After the protest was reinstated, I submitted a FOIA request to the agency's FOIA officer, Austin Hill. After no response, I inquired again, and again, and again. And finally, I received a heavily redacted production, which included no police incident reports, which should be disclosed to the agency pursuant to the code. I was told that the agency does not receive these incident reports and would provide none to me. Uh, the latter was true, but the former was a misrepresentation. I used the limited FOIA disclosure that we received to request that the ABRA uh, agency issue subpoenas to the store clerks who sold alcohol to minors uh, as disclosed in the FOIA disclosure. Those subpoenas were issued, but were not enforced. In fact, they were refused to be enforced. Uh, Chairperson Anderson commented that we've done our part. This withheld from the protestants crucial witnesses that we needed to prove our case. And the list goes on. The agency cited improper federal rules of procedure to make filings more onerous, mistakenly served the board's final order on a random email instead of mine, excluded police reports as hearsay, contrary to controlling DC law, excluded liquor law violations from consideration of the appropriateness of the establishment in the community because the store didn't commit those criminal violations and so couldn't be held accountable for what was happening on their property. Again, the list goes on. But worst of all, 
member short exposed that other members of the board had made their decision before the ANC and us, the, the group of five, had put on our evidence. Uh, it's a severe procedural due process violation. And so all this leads me to two points and recommendations that I would well, make. Uh, did you actually over your time, if you want to summarize it? The, the two Absolutely. Points. Yep, yep. Just final two points that I want to make. First, the agency just really needs to fulfill its crucial governmental function. It needs to be taken seriously. Licenses should not be rubber stamped before counter evidence is marshaled and presented to the community. Second, we need a better way to further the truth seeking function of the agency's administrative hearings. That, to that end, the ANC needs to have standing to appeal, needs to have access to crucial information. So uh, I, I would just urge uh, you and, and all involved to, to try and eliminate the obstructionism that we've encountered. Throughout. Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to have to cut you off your, sure. about a minute over your time, and I appreciate you, it. We're going to go next to Joy Doyle. And good morning to you. If you can, uh, you already unmuted yourself. Uh, thank you for being yes. here and giving your testimony. Thank you. Yes, hi, thank you for having me, Councilman McDuffie. My name is Joy Doyle. I'm a resident here for almost 20 years in Ward 8. I'm a small business owner, a member of the Congress Heights Homeowners Association, and I'm a subject matter expert in stakeholder and communication management, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd like to start by sharing my personal experience when testifying in front of ABRA. Um, this is related to equitable engagement and cultural competency communication. Um, Chair, uh, Chairperson Donovan Anderson was leading the hearing for this testimony. His engagement practices were rude, discourteous. They were perceived to be intolerant for the community witnesses um, for their lack of preparation and exposure to the ABRA testimony process. Um, the discourteous behavior to um, Representative Carolyn Reed, Dr. Reed, who holds a doctor um, degree herself, myself as a PhD student, to me was mind blowing. It takes courage for community members to come in front of any board and publicly testify and to be treated with such disrespect is no more than intimidation and bullying tactic. How educated do we have to be to come before these boards? How, how groomed do we have to be? Not just to be invited in the room, but to also have a seat at the table. So if ABRA is choosing to to engage community members in such a disrespectful and intimidating way, then I have to ask for them to invest in resources for cultural competency and humility training and also equitable engagement practices. We cannot have this as we're trying to do this social justice work to change our neighborhoods. The lack of oversight of ABRA and the disconnection that they're making on the impact of these minority communities with so many liquor stores in underserved areas is the greatest example of being a gatekeeper to white supremacy. The research shows that African-Americans face higher density of liquor stores than whites. And the research shows this mismatch of the alcohol demand and supply in urban neighborhoods. This is co a constituting environmental justice for minorities in low and low income persons in underserved communities. Um, and just is a direct contribution to the social determinants of health. If I, if I could ask someone to please mute their phone and I'm gonna ask to hold my time. Yeah, not, my apologies for that. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Chauvin, if you were present would perhaps apologize for that. If staff could mute Frank Chauvin. Okay, he's been muted uh, and we'll give you another, can we uh, give an additional 30 seconds to Joyce Doyle? We know that the research finds that the number of alcohol licenses on the, ten, on the census track uh, by 10% raises the total crime rate of 9.2. And we also must think about the externalities, the negative externalities as it's impacting uh, homeowners like myself and what we call black gentrification, which really serve as a middle class to underserved communities. The liquor stores must be held accountable. ABRA must do their jobs. They must allow minorities to come into these neighborhoods to help these communities so we can close the racial wealth gap. But as long as they continue to turn a blind eye and allow, allow Fox News and other media outlets to show the what happens on corners in unmonitored neighborhoods, then we will get nowhere. We will get nowhere collectively and we will continue to suffer from businesses to so the social impacts to the environment 
environmental impacts, and really the, the biosphere. So thank you for hearing my testimony today. I'm looking for change and equitable engagement and how ABRA engages the community members who want change in the places they pay taxes and they live. And thank you for your testimony. We're gonna turn next to Kimon Freeman. It's good to see you. Uh, you can begin your testimony, thank you. Peace and blessings and good afternoon, Councilman. Good luck to you, by the way, in your age year race. Um, this is Kimon Freeman, representing uh, WEAC Radio, Ward 5 and 8. And I'm here to advocate that a racial equity lens be applied to uh, ABRA's existing um, uh, uh, rules and regulations and to their potentially expanding scope of work. Um, I want to point out in the I-71 uh, that we've been uh, faced with the allegation that we have a black market. Um, this is, um, I, I, this, I think, is a complete uh, exaggeration of the facts that Black people have been uh, overly policed, uh, overly incarcerated, and still are the number one arrest for uh, any weed possessions in the city. I-71 um, laws allows for uh, the consumption of, of weed uh, on private property. And we all know who owns most of the private property in the city. We also know that it doesn't allow for the consumption of marijuana uh, in public housing. We know who all um, comprises public housing in Washington, D.C. So we see a disparity right then and there. And so to um, and, and there, there was um, efforts to further um, extend criminal penalties um, to black people uh, uh, for weed consumption. Uh, but those uh, efforts were defeated and now they're in their desperation uh, to maximize the profits of uh, the uh, existing um, uh, dispensaries who are blaming and scapegoating um, Black people for any potential loss of revenue when there's actually the delay of the, um, the licenses renewal uh, that uh, have nothing to do with the I-71 uh, participants. So I want to point that out. Uh, then two, um, we don't seem to have the same type of um, 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 uproar about the oversaturation of liquor stores in um, Black communities. Uh, we tried our best to get a liquor store shut down when a six-year-old girl was murdered uh, at the corner of uh, Martin Luther King Avenue um, and Malcolm X Avenue. Nothing's there but, uh, there, um, but uh, a food desert. Um, there's seven liquor stores in a one-block radius of that intersection, uh, but no one could actually, on the Abra board, two council members, and even the mayor itself can answer how many liquor stores are too many liquor stores. And we have yet to address that. And we want to scratch our heads about violence in the city and we setting these people up to fail. How are you going to have um, uh, uh, oversaturation of liquor stores, seven liquor stores on one block radius in the midst of a food desert? And that's not a result of public policy. That's not contributing to um, uh, delinquent behavior. That's not uh, contributing to um, the decay of, of, of our communities. And that is because of a uh, agreed on a tax base increasing uh, agreed um, uh, for maintaining a tax base. And I think we need to point that out. And I think that uh, Abro has to um, come to bear a racial equity lens in addressing these issues. And until we get answers to those questions of how many liquor stores is too many liquor stores in our communities, I don't think Abra has done their job. And if that is the same way they're going to apply uh, in expanding powers to the cannabis and the I-71 com um, uh, compliant participants, um, I'm here to um, um, say that their racial echo lens is definitely in order. Thank you. And thank you uh, for your testimony this morning. I want to turn to Commissioner uh, Eric Bena. And my apologies. I think uh, my list that I was working from uh, somehow did not include your name, but my staff uh, pointed that out. And I appreciate the note that you uh, sent as well. So let me turn next to you, Commissioner. And good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Good morning. Thanks so much. It actually worked out because my camera wasn't working. So uh, uh, Chairman McDuffie, a member of the committee. Uh, my name is Eric Bana. I am the ANC Commissioner for ANC1B08. I've chaired ANC1B's Alcohol Beverage Regulation Committee. Um, which oversees U Street, 14th Street, and parts of Georgia Avenue. Um, so there's a lot of Auburn licensed establish a lot of Auburn licensed establishments in that uh, uh, those areas. Um, so I want to also want to note I've worked as a server and bartender, and I patronize establishments in this area. I recognize what a difficult environment uh, the COVID pandemic has been for small business owners. Uh, however, many issues have been brought to us, and I want to elevate those uh, to you today. Uh, first, the density of Auburn licensed establishments is a concern that has been repeatedly expressed by community members in the vicinity of U Street. More and more licenses have been issued over the years, and we've been told by Auburn that licensing 
density of existing licenses is not considered when making decisions. Um, Auburn instead shifts its responsibility to the Office of the Zoning Administrator. Uh, and this office has made a lot of mistakes in keeping an inventory of eating and drinking establishments, which has allowed many of the blocks around U Street to exceed the maximum uh, frontage of bars and restaurants that is capped by law under zoning regulations. Auburn refuses repeatedly to consider the number of existing establishments or the current density when making decisions about new licenses. Uh, we ask that there's greater coordination with the Office of the Zoning Administrator, and th that office can provide data on the density of license establishments on various blocks. We request that Auburn formally begin using this data when deciding on when or whether or not to issue a new liquor license. Second, as a colleague of mine mentioned earlier, um, uh, enforcement has been sorely lacking. Uh, neighbors re neighbors uh, report that uh, establishments frequently violate terms of settlement agreements and requests for enforcement go unanswered. The complaint hotline for noise has, uh, people have found difficulty getting inspectors to come out. And when they do, the inspectors rarely issue noise citations. Finally, um, I would just want to talk about lack of oversight uh, and lack of meaningful consequences for establishments with repeated violations. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, it has become the cost of doing business for many operators who violate the rules time and time again. Uh, I personally witnessed establishments run up violations, close their establishment, and then reopen across the city, now with a clean slate from ABRA. And one establishment in particular was cited for serving to minors, allowing employees to engage in sexual activity within the bar, and quote, losing control of the establishment. However, the establishment received barely a slap on the wrist and was allowed to renew its license without any conditions imposed. It wasn't until the ANC intervened that reasonable restrictions were placed on the establishment's license. We are asking that ABRA consider the owner's history of violations uh, when making license decisions, not just the violations that have accrued to a particular establishment or address. Um, I'll just wrap up and say I, I, the ABRA staff that I've worked with, uh, Sarah Fashbaugh, Martha Jenkins, the folks in legal have been extremely helpful and competent. However, more support, communication, and accessibility is needed, uh, especially in ANCs like ours, where there's a high number of ABRA licensed establishments. Thank you. And thank you uh, for your testimony. I want to thank each of the witnesses for their testimony here today. Uh, let me start just really quickly. I don't know if uh, I don't think I see Councilmember Pinto right now, but staff, uh, if the council member or any of my colleagues appears, and please put me on the clock. Um, I only have a couple of questions for the panel, but uh, Commissioner, you you mentioned having it sounded like uh, a pretty decent relationship with at least some of the folks who you have engaged with at Abra. And you, then you mentioned toward the end of your testimony, additional resources. Uh, but then you also talked about a lack of enforcement uh, with some licensees, uh, particularly repeat uh, offenders. In your experience, is this, what's, what would you characterize as, as the, the most pressing issue facing ABRA? Is it a resource issue or is it a need for them to really step up enforcement with the resources that they have, which in your opinion are adequate to, to be able to step up enforcement? I would say that um, there's just a lack of, of follow through in that, um, you know, a, a violations may be issued, but they, they aren't really accruing over time, if that makes sense. There's not meaningful consequences. So by operators are allowed to have violations and then renew their license year after year. And ABRA doesn't really put conditions on them unless the ANC takes it to a protest hearing. And so I would like, you know, members of our community would like ABRA to be a bit more contemplative and judicious and when when reviewing these licenses and not just rubber stamping them. Um, and I'll, I'll underscore what Ms. Doyle said earlier, um, having attended some of these uh, ABRA protest hearings, it's kind of a harrowing experience. So I will underscore what Ms. Doyle said about providing resources for cultural competence and, you know, the way that some members of the board treat members of the community who, uh, who testify at these hearings is not the most professional. So I, I would underscore her, her earlier. Well, I appreciate you and uh, Joyce Doyle uh, bringing that up. Obviously, uh, these folks are an extension of, of government uh, in their service as 
uh, members of boards or commissions in the District of Columbia, and uh, uh, there's a baseline of courtesy that should be afforded to anybody who appears, uh, understanding that everybody who appears won't be uh, experts in a particular field, um, but could simply be, you know, uh, ANC commissioners or residents who care and are impacted by the work that is being conducted by a particular board or commission. So thank you, Joyce Doyle and Commissioner, for raising that. Uh, and I'll bring that up uh, when, when we uh, turn to our government witnesses for ABRA. Uh, and as uh, usually the, the chair will appear with uh, Director Musal. I'm not sure if, if, if that's the plan today, but uh, we'll be sure to, to raise that issue. Um, in terms of uh, enforcement, on, I know uh, Naima Jefferson also raised some concerns around this. And so I kind of want to uh, pose a similar question. Do you think this is a matter of, of resources or more a matter of will and focus on, on addressing some of the issues around enforcement uh, and really communicating with uh, the neighborhoods and the residents who are, who are impacted by the decisions that I have? Um, Oh, well, I was going to ask Naima Jefferson and Joyce Doyle. Okay, um, I'll start. So I, I would say that, um, you know, some of what was said by um, other panelists resonated with me in our experience here in Ward 4. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't attribute it necessarily to resources. I would attribute it to there being an equity in enforcement, um, meaning that um, when it is um, brought up in, in an investigative report, there's often an offer of compromise um, that uh, doesn't necessarily result in suspension or revocation. We have an establishment in our community that had three cease and desist from the Department of Health for hookah smoking, even had a closure for hookah smoking, and they are still operating today. They also had building permit violations. They had uh, violations with the fire department. Um, uh, we brought it up to DCRA that they're selling hookah without a license. And so therefore the district is even missing out on sales tax revenue. Um, and they're not properly reporting um, their revenues to ABRA uh, in, because they're, they're really not supposed to be selling hookah. And none of that is investigated or moved forward. Um, we sometimes get the excuse that, um, you know, well, oh, that's outside of our jurisdiction. But actually, if you look at the enabling statute, as well as the regulation, not only is it for licensing and regulation, but it, there's also a health component to it um, that is in there. And that often gets ignored. And I know recently there was a case, um, I think it was with um, MK, where um, it was appealed and um, the, the, uh, my understanding is that the opinion came back that ABRA doesn't have um, enforcement over health and why they don't have enforcement over health directly, they do have enforcement in the actual uh, municipal regulations about complying with other district laws and regulations. That is explicit. And that's the piece that is not being enforced um, consistently. So um, I, I think there, there may need to be, um, the, the issue is really at the board level, to be honest. Sure, you know, and it also sounds like there's, there's a level of coordination that is not occurring uh, with sister agencies, uh, where and I see Council Member uh, yes. shaking her head, and I know uh, there are, and I made this point, I think, in a recent hearing, or maybe as it relates to some bill that, that came before the full council. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've talked with my staff about the need for coordination uh, uh, in terms of ABRA's ability to do its job. Now, now obviously, ABRA's statute speaks to what its authority is, but I think it's, it's pretty uh, common that uh, a, an assist from uh, an agency, be it the Department of Health or DCRA, uh, in many cases is warranted in order for agencies to be able to effectively carry out their specific missions. And I, I hear that in your testimony, and I've heard that uh, in other instances with respect to ABRA and other agencies uh, needing to work better and sharing information so that the, the right hand of government understands what the left hand is doing and ultimately uh, best serving the residents of the District of Columbia. And so 
Uh, Joyce Doyle, you have your hand up. Yes, um, you know, to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility uh, as core values across any business or agency, it starts at the top with leadership. Behavior, whether good or bad, is allowed. So um, some of the engagement practices that have been experienced have been allowed. And my story obviously today is not the only story. So yes, we can ask for resources for training and doing better, but if we don't have a shift in leadership, if we don't have a shift in behavior, ethical behavioral practices, then how can we address some of these social and environmental issues that are impacting these underserved and marginalized communities? There is no possible way. Now, if we're gonna continue with a hands-off approach um, based on the internal policies within ABRA, then I'm gonna suggest that we follow President Biden's uh, executive order 13985, I believe, that we can start doing these equity barrier analysis to look at the processes and procedures and policies that exist within these agencies and then do these externality um, uh, 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 research studies to figure out how are they impacting the small businesses? How are they impacting can, can the, the social question? environment? And so Just on. Doing, yes, yes. Are you familiar with the REACH Act? The REACH Act, no. Okay, let, let me, uh, I'd love to have my staff share some information with you about it. I actually authored and REACH stands for Racial Equity Achieved Results. Uh, it actually established uh, uh, what is, should be a racial equity framework, uh, both at the council and in the executive and the uh, other agencies uh, that do the work of the executive, including boards and commissions. There is an office of racial equity at the council, we call it the core for short, uh, which requires uh, that uh, some bills that come before the council are scored using a racial equity impact assessment. Uh, it also requires the executive to develop a similar tool to measure performance of the executive branch uh, agencies. And uh, Dr. Amber Hewitt uh, heads that office. So I would encourage you to reach out directly to her. Uh, Dr. Brian McClure uh, uh, heads the, the council's office on racial equity. Uh, I appreciate the, the um, uh, what President Biden has been uh, able to, to do with this executive order, but I think we have a great uh, a bill, a law that is in place, uh, and we, we really need to get up to speed uh, and do more that is required under the REACH Act. But if you haven't seen it, give me your background. I heard you mention uh, your work and your background. I would encourage you to check it out. And feel free to reach out to, to, to my office uh, if you have any questions about that. I will. I just want to have one last statement. Until we, if we have to continue to fight intercultural prejudice when we see minorities in positions that are not doing this work, then really what are we doing and where are we going? It is, it is a true issue. There are dollars here. There are people moving into these communities, particularly Ward 8, that can help build the economic development, that can small businesses, but we can't walk up on Martin Luther King and Malcolm X because of these barriers. And so if we don't start taking accountability and also maybe asking these liquor licensed businesses to have social impact statements themselves and being held accountable or maybe even becoming B Corp to benefit corporations, that might be another opportunity so that we can make change. The Congress Heights Homeowners Association, we held an equitable engagement meeting with the Mart liquor owners. And let me tell you this, after the millions and millions of dollars they've made over 25 years, they still were unaware of the impact of their business model to this community here. Here. And gotcha. so we're doing the let, work, let but me, we need me, leadership to change. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, again, I would encourage you to reach out to the Council's Office of Racial Equity, as well as uh, the uh, Office on Racial Equity uh, within the executive branch as well. Uh, I see Mark Lee has raised uh, a hand. I want to go to Mark Lee. And then uh, the final comment uh, will be from Commissioner Adolfo, and then we're going to switch to the last panel of public witnesses uh, before uh, we take a brief recess. Mark Lee. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I just wanted to make one small point uh, regarding the complaints about the ABC Board uh, conduct from a perspective of racial equity or cultural competency. I think it's important that we keep in mind that uh, uh, ABRA case hearings, whether they're license renewals, uh, license applications or um, 
uh, enforcement uh, transactions, uh, that these are not town hall meetings. Uh, and while they're not legal cases, they are administrative hearings. And there are certain rules of evidence and certain rules of um, conduct that are uh, the uh, ABC board chair Donovan is correct and, in, uh, and appropriate in uh, maintaining and enforcing uh, because these are administrative um, uh, procedures and they're not uh, general conversations or town hall sessions. And I just wanted to offer that observation in the context of uh, any criticism that might be directed to the ABC board in that regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm not. It, it, I'm not sure if folks are referring to a specific um, um, hearing that occurred, uh, and, and I'm not aware of any specific hearing that folks may be referring to. But what I got was uh, was was less about whether there was a specific hearing or interaction um, with the chair, and more. I guess my takeaway more broadly is that uh, there is a level of courtesy and respect being extended to people who appear before the board and are, are, are rightfully parties before the board uh, as it conducts its business. And so um, I, I appreciate that Abraham's on town halls, but uh, if a person is is a, a, a party before an Abra uh, in an official capacity, whether as uh, an ANC or otherwise, um, that, that simple courtesy of engagement should be extended to that person or persons. And so uh, I appreciate again, those comments. I'm gonna turn to, to Commissioner uh, Adolfo and then the final comment from uh, Vet Alexander. You did, I, I mentioned you earlier and I forgot to come back to you. So uh, Commissioner Adolfo. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, something that I think is very important is what the language is in the Abra code. And so we have seen an instance where Spar Liquor failed to appear at uh, one of the hearings. And from the way that it reads is if you if you fail to appear at a hearing, then the case is dismissed on behalf of the other in favor of the other party. And as the ANC, we did everything that we need to do to show up at the hearing, filed all the things that we needed to file in a timely manner. And for Spar Liquor, that was not the case, but yet they were still granted another opportunity. And as I tried to get further clarification, the staff at the uh, at Abra explained to me, well, this is what the policy is. They're allowed to come back and file for a second time. And I think that th those are some of the things I would love to sit and talk with your office about in terms of looking at the Abra code and seeing what we can do. Because as advisory neighborhood commissioners, we don't have the luxury of being available all of the time. Many of us have other jobs, families, so forth and so on. I'm, you know what we're dealing with at the ASC level. And so if we schedule time during the day when these hearings are held, and sometimes they can go on for hours, it's just not feasible. And we don't have the budget to get attorneys to do all of these things. And so I think just if we're sticking to the code, then they need to be able to stick to the code. And I'm sure that ABRA is enforcing what the standard is. So then I would love to sit and talk with your office to see how we can do that, as well as to look at the difference in license renewals versus initial licensing, because the criteria yeah. for renewal is far less stringent than it is for initial licensing. Thank okay. You. Thank you for that, Commissioner uh, Yvette Alexander. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'll be really brief because I did hear something about the I-71 compliance. I think when we're talking about enforcement, because ABRA's realm of responsibility has expanded now to the cannabis industry, maybe they need to have individual inspectors that can focus on cannabis, that can focus on nightclubs, that can focus on um, the, the liquor licenses so that they won't be overwhelmed and they could get around to the enforcement that they need to get to. But I just wanted to stress I-71 is not a racial issue. It's an issue of perception and, and abiding by the law. Um, we know that I-71 is not intended for businesses. Gifting is illegal. I wanna make that clear. For businesses to gift, that is illegal. I-71 compliance is for home use, home grow, and home share. In terms of the inequity for where people can consume cannabis, the legally licensed um, dispensaries 
now have the opportunity to invite those that are not able to consume in their private residences, they can consume in the dispensaries in a safe space. That has been introduced in regulation. So that is open. So there's no discrimination there. But the gifting I wanna stress is illegal and we need civil enforcement. The majority of the 600 million annually in sales is coming from out of state where these products are not tested and we don't know if they're safe. We don't even know what our district residents are consuming. There's no way that this is from home grow um, with I-71 when there's over $600 million in sales annually. These are coming from out of state junk that's, that other states are not selling. They're bringing into the District of Columbia. So as an African-American woman speaking, I want African-Americans to open up businesses. I am wholeheartedly, and the association is wholeheartedly in support of social and racial equity in the cannabis business, but it must be done legally. Let me and ask you a question. Do, do yeah. you feel like the, 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 there is, I mean, ABRA was obviously an agency that was, was established to, to deal with um, uh, alcohol. Um, we've expanded its mission and mandate to include cannabis, do, do you find that the, the, your interactions with Avra, that there are members and, and staff who have an adequate understanding and experience uh, of the industry? Uh, there needs to be more. Uh, there has been a shift. There, there are some people, um, Mr. Gordy, Sean Gordy, he's well aware of the industry. There has been some shift of people from the Department of Health to the agency that have assisted but overall, there needs to be a better understanding. And they have worked with the association with the legally licensed dispensaries and cultivators, but um, we need more interaction and more understanding because we want the program to be successful. And I think they need to listen to the experts who are the legally licensed um, representatives in the district that can give them advice, such as the self-certification such as the sliding scale report and the enforcement, the civil enforcement. These can all be um, a great, of great assistance to grow the program and so that right. we can get into the adult use program. Thank so you. I implore them. Yeah, they, they have been working with us, but we need to really, we've been reaching out to the council, the mayor and ABRA um, and it's not rhetoric from a paid lobbyist. I'm not a lobbyist. Let, let, let me, I don't want to turn it into a <laughs> I'm I reading the, the um, comment. Well, I'm, I'm reading not, the I'm comments. Reading let the me stay chat. away from the comments. Let's stay away but from no, the chat. But Abra, um, they have been working with us. Um, I can only speak for our interaction, the board, as well as Director Masali. Got it. Got very it. Responsive to us. Thank you so much. And I thank everybody <laughs> on this panel for their comments. Uh, and I appreciate the observations made by Felicia Danza as well. I always appreciate labor uh, providing a perspective about how these agencies are interacting with its workers. That's very helpful. Uh, and, and thank you, everybody. We're gonna transition to our last, and Mark Lee, you can stay on board. We're gonna transition to our last panel of public witnesses. We'll give the staff a moment to transition just some people off of this panel. Uh, and I don't know if you have a separate testimony, but I wanna give Mark Lee uh, an opportunity since you had signed up to talk, testify as a public witness on the performance of the Office of Nightlife and Culture, an opportunity to provide your testimony. And you can begin with that testimony now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council member. Um, uh, we will be uh, submitting a, a written statement uh, this week, uh, by the end of the week. Um, but I just wanted to offer a few observations. Um, as you know, um, the uh, Nightlife hospitality community uh, strongly supported the creation of the uh, Mayor's Office of Nightlife and Culture uh, uh, a couple of years, two or three years ago. Um, we were very appreciative of um, the uh, performance uh, and uh, contribution of the initial um, director, uh, Sean Townsend, and, and testified to that uh, uh, in that manner to um, be before this committee. Uh, in previous years. And we have met with and um, ha have welcomed uh, Director Vandernat, uh, who has recently come on board. Um, the only, um, uh, you know, th there's uh, the 
um, business, the nightlife business community is very large. There are approximately 1,400 um, bar, restaurant, and nightclub licensees. Uh, so just in that realm, they have a huge uh, in, uh, uh, relational uh, obligation. Um, they have a small staff and they have a lot of work to do. So we hope two things. One, that the council will ensure that they have the resources they need um, as Director Vandernat um, uh, uh, gets her feet uh, on the ground uh, more firmly in her new role, um, that they have adequate resources to handle the large universe of licensees with whom they interact with. Um, and secondly, as we come out of uh, the pandemic period, and as we work to ensure that uh, our social and cultural amenities that are represented by bars, restaurants, nightclubs, entertainment venues, and also live music venues, which I know um, is a particular focus of Director Vandernat, um, that we look to how we can um, uh, promote uh, what is a very rich, uh, richly unique um, uh, business landscape here. Unlike any other large city in the country, um, Washington benefits from having a 96% independently owned and operated small business um, nightlife environment for uh, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, music venues. And that's a very precious commodity that we want to be able to protect and preserve. And in the same way that Events DC uh, has the opportunity to market the city to tourists and conventioneers and to develop that business, I think we should look at part of our recovery being uh, the mayor's office on nightlife and culture being able to manage a marketing and promotion campaign, both within the city, within the metropolitan area and within the region and even nationally to uh, promote this very precious commodity uh, we have here and to ensure that it exits the pandemic period uh, in, in as strong a position as possible. And so those are just a few thoughts and we'll offer some more in our written testimony and thank you for allowing uh, us to testify today. And thank you for signing up to testify. Uh, I'll note, uh, uh, Kathy Hollinger, who's president, CEO of Restaurant Association, also indicated that she'll be providing uh, written testimony to the committee. Uh, we appreciate the work that the Office of Nightlife and Culture does. Uh, we look forward to hearing from its director uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, and thank you. And we also look forward to seeing your written testimony uh, as well, Mark Lee. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, we certainly want to continue to support uh, our small businesses in our, our, our nightlife and, and, and culture community. So thank you for that. The committee is gonna take a recess uh, now. We're gonna reconvene at 2.45 uh, p.m. Uh, and so the time is now 12.30 p.m. And uh, this hearing is going to recess. Thank you. <laughs>